this could be somewhat of a shallow recession, but more prolonged period of downturn. The market is going to continue to heal over the next year, but you're still going to have a more volatile environment. The covenant soft landing, maybe it will happen. You know, maybe we have the disinflationary forces. It has to go all the way to two for the Fed to be able to truly step off the brakes and allow for a neutral policy. We're all certainly trying to figure out when the point is correct for the Fed to slow down, when the tightening is going to slow down. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramos, and Tom Keene. Thank you for joining Bloomberg Surveillance on radio, on television. It's boring out there. It's Thursday. Claims, yes. We'll get some housing data. Forget about it. Absolute history in the land of Bramo with curve inversion, our number one story today. Lisa, you nailed this yesterday on a tweet. We go back 40 years for the unusualness of this moment. The significance of this is we're looking at a slowdown. How steep is the slowdown going to be? What are the contours of it? Will it be short and shallow? Will it be long and shallow? Will it be a deep and short? All of these questions of how much pain do we have to yet see? And then you have a lot of people trying to push back against that and saying the earnings haven't been so bad. And when they have haven't been so bad. You get right. sometimes a surprise I, rally. I got eight questions, you folks. This is the wheelhouse of the unknown Bramo years ago at Bloomberg News. This is really oh, what she does. Absolute best. We're going to advance that conversation. Ira Jersey will join us later. Ian Lingen will join us from BMO Capital Market on what you need to know about 63 basis points of inversion. How does it filter out into investment grade credit, high yield credit and that. Does it does it filter out into your real world? If you take a step back, the reason why this matters so much is that if people are getting paid more to go into short term debt, to basically lend for one year or two years, they're earning substantially more than going out and lending for 10 years. What does that say about the prospects longer term and where are people going to put their money? They're going to hide it. They're not necessarily going That's to have the conviction. That's what this is about. That's really well said. Yep. This, this is about cash under the mattress. I got to park my money out 20 years, which folks leads into the auction yesterday of the 20 year which actually was good mattered it's time now for bloomberg surveillance auction <laughs> talk let's go there literally explain People to mere mortals like me why the 20 year auction yesterday falls into ian lingan's shock of massive inversion the one consensus right now that we keep hearing from guest after guest by long duration that is a new consensus. People right. have tried it before. They've gotten their faces ripped off. And here we are. We're doing it again. And people saying, regardless of what's happening, based on the Fed speak that we've been getting, they are convinced they are committed to torpedoing inflation, right. whatever it takes, even if there is some sort of significant downturn. So on a quiet day, it's not quiet. In the land of fixed income, it's a huge, huge day with historic curve inversion. Ira Jersey, again, looking for Volcker-like inversion possible. I'm going to put the word possible on that. It's also possible the chance of the exchequer will move the market in London and will move sterling uh, pricing in on a Bloomberg at a rounded up 119 this morning. Guy Johnson says this is an important speech. Well, it's important because we've all been looking for what sort of fiscal austerity we're going to get from the United Kingdom in the face of inflation at 11.1 percent, the latest CPI read, right? How much do they have to cut back spending in order to uh, appease really the, the guilt market and, and frankly, the pound market, the FX market? How much do they have to respond to something that Liz Truss could not not respond to. And then what is the response if they just cause an even deeper recession? Well, is that positive for the pound or is that negative for the We're going to jump to this at 630 here. You're going to see it here on Bloomberg where the chancellor will announce one of all the headlines of that and then Guy Johnson will translate for us uh, from London. What I find fascinating here is it's austerity, but we've never had austerity with the full employment that we have right now, or at least the full employment we see in uh, November. How quickly is it moving? <clears throat> and one of the big mysteries heading into 2023, how significant are the lag effects? How much are we going to feel the burn of whatever yeah, the Fed and central banks around the world are going to do? Gita Gopinath, really excellent on this, over at NEF in Singapore, talking yeah. about how we don't have a sense of how much you're going to end up with all of these uh, together moves from our central banks well, around the world, what the effects are going to be and how dramatic. Through the hour, we'll get through this. John Williams of the New York Fed with uh, some important comments yesterday along the line of Dr. Gopinath um, as well. Futures at negative 20. Uh, the, the, data. I mean, it's there. The curve inversion <laughs> is the lead story. Negative 64 uh, basis points. 10-year yield 3.73 at a 3.69 yesterday showing price up, yield down. 
going for that long-term duration. Oil doesn't give me a story, $92 on Brent. And foreign exchange with one big muddle, one big churn here. A sterling as we go to Jeremy Hunt. It's 630, 118.56. I need a brief because I'm focused on claims and housing. What else is going on? It's the reality television show that is Fed Speak. I mean, honestly, every really? day. I didn't know that. It's live blogging at the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> it is the reality TV. Federal Reserve officials, they're just like us. But honestly, every single day, the rhetoric, the drumbeat coming out. Today, it includes St. Louis Fed President James Bullard, Fed Governor Michelle Bowen, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester, Fed Governor Philip Jefferson, and Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari. <clears throat> and tonight, if that wasn't enough, Charlie Evans is having a retirement party uh, from the Chicago Fed. There'll be remarks from Jay Powell, John Williams, and Mary Daly. No, we hear Daly. from the so, chairman. We well, from the chairman it's not going to be anything that's substantial in terms of monetary policy. I, It'll I, be, we appreciate you, Charlie. Thank you for being with us, et cetera, et cetera, on your uh, exit of the Chicago Fed. It's interesting. This has actually been moving markets okay. more than anything else. What's your what's your skepticism? Here, bring it up again here, folks. And on radio, we're bringing up all the faces of the speakathon uh, today at the Fed. John Williams yesterday not linking financial stability into monetary exercise. The PhD from Indiana, newly minted Michelle Bowman, Loretta Mester, an arch mathematician from Cleveland, Philip Jefferson with terrific social economic credibility as a Fed governor and the aerospace engineer from Minneapolis. I mean, everybody's got a different background. Everybody's got a different story. And we're all listening because that has been moving the markets probably more than anything recently. Economic data out today at 8.30 a.m., including October housing starts, building permits, as well as initial jobless claims. And then at 10 a.m., we get October home sales. I'm watching the home data. Yes. Because the housing market, to me, is one of the right. biggest financial risks I keep reading about. We'll dig into it more coming up. But I also uh, want to mention we're getting retail earnings. Macy's at 655 estimated this oh, okay. morning. Kohl's at 7. Ross stores at 4 p.m. Gap at 415. How much are we looking at a bifurcated of the haves and the have-nots, a bifurcated picture yeah. among the retailers, and how much are we getting a sense? This holiday season might not be so Wasn't great. Wasn't Dana Telsey fun yesterday? She was great. Retail. We should get her back Just on. Just really, really capturing the moment. I want to do this right now with a brief as quick as I can, and I'll re-mention this every hour. The best tweet yesterday, Jason Furman uh, teaching. Act 10 up at Harvard, and he says there's two core inflations out there. Lisa, there's a core inflation of 5.8% based on existing leases, and the new spot market lease core inflation is a stunningly low 2.8%. Yeah, how quickly can we get that? Retweeted by the laureate Krugman. Uh, and so that's really important for housing. Let's get to it right now. In foreign exchange, Vasilios Giannakis joins us, head of European FX strategy at Citigroup. We have austerity and an austerity speech in the United Kingdom, Vasilios. Tell me about the new austerity you see and what that will do to the dollar. Well, uh, as far as the UK is concerned, I think uh, potentially we've swung the pendulum from one side where we had uh, Quantex's uh, mini budget uh, that um, was judged to be to a large extent uh, uh, irresponsible and created that um, uh, currency crisis, uh, confidence of crisis, as I called it. But right now, uh, obviously, to appease markets and to restore part of the loss credibility, potentially we're moving towards the other end. Um, I think what, it, what is important, that the, the number of points that are, are actually important in, in, the mini, in the, sorry, the budget announcement that we're going to get. First of all, um, uh, will it go deep enough? Uh, will it go far enough in terms of the actual austerity measures? Um, and everything that we're reading and all the headlines that we're seeing suggest that it will. Uh, and in that respect, uh, it will actually be a, a fiscal package that will aim to a certain extent to basically fight inflation. So in a sense, you're going to have monetary policy and fiscal policy moving together, which brings me to the second point, that this alleviates part of the pressure from, uh, for, uh, from the Bank of England uh, to be very aggressive on uh, interest rate hikes. And you know, I've been saying this for quite some time. I don't think that the Bank of England has the willingness to go really hard on interest rates because it's very, very much aware of the impending uh, sharp correction in, in the housing market. That has been the case uh, in, in all previous downturns in the UK. Uh, the UK mortgage market is very idiosyncratic in its nature. It has a very, very short um, uh, fixed rate mortgage offering, which means that at every point in time, we get more individuals uh, that need to refinance at the debt yeah. prevailing uh, higher rates. I think bottom line, the message uh, Sterling is going to get, which I think has been leaving some sort of a too euphoric environment 
um, is that we're heading towards a deeper and longer recession. The BOV is going to be priced lower. And I think ultimately all of that is going to be bad so for sterling. That should be bad for sterling, which raises, really raises this question, because as you were speaking, I wasn't sure where you were going in terms of this, this is good for sterling or bad for sterling if you end up curbing inflation. At what point does austerity kill the momentum of a currency? And at what point does it support because it's actually helping kill off the inflation that so many people have been uh, worried about? Well, listen, I think th these things work in cycles. Um, uh, as I said before, uh, I think the austerity is likely to restore part of the credibility. But equally at the same time, uh, there will be a, a long and deep recession staring sterling in the face. So um, the, the recovery in the UK is probably potentially going to lag the recovery in other countries, which means that you're going to have a reshuffling of portfolio allocations. Uh, so at the initial stage of the austerity, it will be a bad thing for the currency. Uh, as the austerity progresses, and of course, you start seeing some of the benefits of that, meaning a lower debt-to-GDP ratio, uh, then that potentially starts providing, setting the stage up for a, for a recovery in the currency. But again, I'll go, I'll mention this uh, one more time. Right. Aside all these things, the UK is facing a structural problem which is deeply rooted right. to Brexit. We're going to have to leave and it there. This, Vas well, Vasilios, yeah. we're going to have to leave it there because of time, and we've got to get to 6.30 and the Chancellor as well. Vasilios Giannakis of Citigroup, thank you so much uh, for a brief there, particularly on pound sterling uh, this morning. It will be an austere speech here in about 15 minutes, and then Guy Johnson will follow with analysis. Pound sterling, 118.59, up significantly. Sterling strength off the depths of what we saw as Sunak became prime minister. Stay with us in New York. Lisa Bramowitz and Tom Keene. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. More than a week after the elections, Republicans have won a narrow majority in the House that gives them the power to halt President Biden's agenda. Still, their slim margin is a letdown. The party had counted on decisive election results as a springboard for the 2024 presidential race. In the UK, investors will be watching closely when Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt delivers his budget message today. The, late, the last British budget it threw markets into a tailspin because it's a large tax cut package. Hunt will be calling for tax hikes and spending cuts aimed at stabilizing public finances. Former FTC CEO Sam Bankman-Fried is telling his side of the company's collapse, and he's doing it through a series of tweets. Bankman-Fried admitted that FTX got overconfident and careless and said he would do his best to save customers cash. FTX's new management said Bankman Fried does not speak on the company's behalf. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has laid out his conditions for peace. Zelensky says a ceasefire won't be enough. He also said the return of territory taken by Russia will allow an end to the war. Zelensky spoke to the Bloomberg New Economy Forum in Singapore. And despite an upbeat quarterly revenue forecast, Cisco Systems says it's cutting jobs to, quote, rebalance the organization, and it's reducing office space to align with its hybrid system. The biggest maker of machines that run computer networks and the Internet said sales will jump 4.5% to 6.5% higher than expected. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Still pretty much gridlock in Washington, and, and I've got to say, Lisa, that's a fine story for the markets. Uh, the markets can live with this because any progressive legislation that makes it out of the Senate and goes to the House will die in the House. Greg Villiers of AGF, really brilliant yesterday on this election that continues. There's no question about that. And his note this morning speaks about Speaker Pelosi, and perhaps we will see news on her future uh, today. We're going to get a brief on that and tie it in to international relations with Anne-Marie Horton at the G20 meetings, wrapping that event up, uh, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent uh, in Indonesia. 
Anne-Marie, I want to link this together in that our editor-in-chief, John Mickeltrade, in conversation with Mr. Zelensky of Ukraine, which comes right over to the first order of business for a Republican House. Do we actually believe the United mm -hmm. States will hold back aid to a nation at war? Well, it's a big question, given the fact that yesterday we had the news that the Republicans, even though it's a slim majority, it's still a majority, they have the control of the House now. And set to be Speaker, most likely, if he can get those 218 formally in January, Kevin McCarthy has said that it will not be a blank check no longer for Ukraine. We should note he has also backtracked, saying that he just wants a little bit more scrutiny. But he is going to have to really deal with a divided party. And right. you have individuals like Marjorie Taylor Greene, the representative from Georgia, saying no more money should go to Ukraine. So that's one of the issues. But we should also note, uh, when John Micklethwaite, our editor-in-chief, sat down with President Zelensky, he's talking about the fact that no one could be 100% sure this was a Ukrainian defense rocket that ended up in Poland. He wants to send Ukrainian officials to Poland. And the president, when he got off of Marine One and before he went into the White House, was asked about these claims from Zelensky. He said that the evidence just doesn't show that. Interesting. Amory, I need to talk about the event of today, perhaps, or maybe on to Christmas, of the retirement of Speaker Pelosi. The gentleman, the congressman from Coney Island, uh, Congressman Jeffries, is touted by some, is taking over as the new speaker, excuse me, the new minority leader for the Democrats. Mm -hmm. Explain for our international audience the symbolism of a Pelosi retirement and a generational shift for Democrats. Well, this would be huge news, and we have to use the word be, Tom, because we don't know yet what Speaker Pelosi uh, is going to be announcing this, uh, af this afternoon in Washington, D.C. We just know from her office that she is set to make an announcement, and it is widely anticipated that she is going to say she will not run for the leadership anymore. And that would pass on to a new generation, as you mentioned. This is something that she has discussed with Democrats, and there was even this, you know, handshake deal that that would happen. But you never know, of course, because Speaker Pelosi has been um, a tactician when it comes to the legislative process, when it comes to uh, making sure she's getting the vote out. And the Democrats did very well, uh, all things considered. Everyone's saying it was going to be a red wave. And also the dollars that she brings in for the party. She was also the first female Speaker of the House. She has decades of legislative work under her belt. So it would be a very huge shift uh, for the Democrats in the House, but we should wait to hear what she has to say first. Quickly, you should note, though, she did say recently that what happened to her husband in the end of October when he was attacked in his own home, she said that would play into her decision. So maybe she does want to take a moment back and spend some more time with her family at, at this moment. Emory, we're about eight minutes away from a statement over in the United Kingdom, expected to be austerity, expected to be cuts across the board with the autumnal statement from Rishi Sunak. In the United States, as we do have the Republicans claiming the majority, albeit a slim majority, in the House, how much are we looking at something not quite similar in the U.S., but perhaps a little bit more of a shift to austerity mm -hmm. and a lack of spending? Well, you can see the Republicans are want to put the absolute brakes on any of those agenda items President Biden wanted to get through. You think of closing corporate loophole taxes. You think of raising corporate taxes or raising taxes on the very wealthy in America. That is something the Republicans are not going to vote on board for. But more immediately, and what markets are going to be the most focused on is, of course, the debt ceiling drama. We deal with this every so often, but the Republicans have said in the campaigning towards the midterm elections that they would potentially use the debt ceiling as hostage to enact spending cuts from the Democrats. So in the immediate future, this is something the markets need to focus on. What kind of deal can the Republicans and Democrats do to make sure we're not at that so-called fiscal cliff? How much are the, really uh, is President Biden coming back from the G20 in an even stronger position versus a somewhat muddied one, especially when it comes to China and what he'd like to see Congress do in terms of setting certain parameters for businesses in the U.S.? Well, it's going to be interesting, as you mentioned, China, because also we do have Xi Jinping continuing on this tour as he's left, even though he uh, hasn't really traveled outside of China. 
of course, since the COVID-19 pandemic. And he had some interesting choice words about making sure that there's not this uh, power balance dynamic fight within the Asia Pacific as he's in Bangkok with the vice president. Uh, Kamala Harris will also be there for the APAC. And when I think of China right now in the United States, what you see is that there's bipartisan support. But there's one issue that we have seen Democrats have taken issue with the White House, and that's the Taiwan Policy Act. This is something that has potentially a lot of momentum, potentially the next Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. When Speaker Pelosi went to Taiwan, he said he'd like himself to lead a delegation, and that would obviously irk Beijing. And that would be an interesting mm -hmm. timing because they're coming off the heels of this summit and meeting they had in Bali, which everyone said was a path to potential warmer relationships, at least more of a dialogue. Right. Potentially that would cause a little bit more fiery rhetoric. Amory Horton, thank you so much. In Bali, wrapping up the G20 uh, meetings today. Uh, my inter email, Lisa, just lit up like a candle. Where in God's name is Pharaoh? Futures negative 25. Dow futures negative 193. John recovering from an autumn. No, we're going to the autumnal speech oh, yeah. with the chancellor. John Farrell yesterday, an autumnal Christmas tree cutting, and we do have to thank you to his family for sending along this image. For those of you on radio, it's too emotional. Farrell decked out in sort of a, you know, U.S. Forest Service green, <laughs> uh, right. choosing out the right, right bush to put in the living room. Okay, first of all, just how many levels can you troll, John, as you say that? You you quote the Dow into a picture where you mock him for getting a Christmas tree so I did early. not mock him. It is just, <laughs> oh, is it, that right? The, clearly on, on the internet yesterday, thank you for your support you know, here. 99.28% of people said, you've got to be kidding me. You know, my, young, 16? <laughs> my youngest son actually <clears throat> said to me last night, he's like, oh, look, the Christmas decorations are starting to go up around the city. Isn't that nice? And I said, you should have tuned in yesterday. In all seriousness, though, and I actually think that we haven't talked about this enough, we're getting a whole host of uh, these retail earnings, and they're talking about people really Attention. are buying. The tension is tangible. Yeah, and it really suggests the fast-moving kind of lag effects that are taking effect perhaps a little bit more significantly. I'm fascinated by it. I'm really fascinated how it rolls over to online and to Amazon well, the, as well. Yeah, the online hasn't been doing so well. Yeah. People want the experience of going We are there. watching historic curve trade. inversion, 64 basis points of inversion. It, in five minutes, Jeremy Hunt of the United Kingdom. Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlitz, and Tom Key. Mr. Farrell, off, off, off today. Let me do data quickly here before we go to the House of Commons. Futures deteriorate, negative 26. Down futures, negative 201. VIX stasis, 24.65, with important housing data coming up today on the yield basis. Up a little bit higher in yield. 10-year yield, 369, out to 3.73. And the curve inversion signaling lots of tension. Ian Lingen. And Ira Jersey to join us here to give you Global Wall Street Brief along through surveillance uh, this morning. Lisa, I really think we have to frame the originality of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. These are usually bright, well-heeled people. They go through the political process. But very few can say, I had the best Olympics ever. And many people consider the 2012 London Olympics to be maybe the best ever and this is the guy that ran it. Can you imagine? Can you think of the headaches? Well, he's going to need to have the marathon endurance because this is not necessarily a one-hour kind of gig. I mean, honestly, you're looking right now at a scenario. I, I really was just saying I can't believe the pound is as strong as it is. That we're talking 119, 120 uh, versus the dollar when you're talking about the potential for fiscal austerity and 11.1 percent inflation. Right? This is a, not a positive scenario based on where we were, and yet people have faith that this is the person who can actually rein things back and get a price that is stability, not necessarily yes. winning not necessarily strength, but at least stability, and that's the goal today. And, of course, what we need to say here is he hasn't had the curtains trimmed yet for his office. We have to remind ourselves going uh, – I mean, Guy Johnson knows better than me. There was Cameron, then May, then Boris and Truss. I believe we're now going to go to the House of Commons for a hugely anticipated speech. Here is the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Many others are worried about the future. So today we deliver a plan – to tackle the cost of living crisis and rebuild our economy. Yeah. Our priorities are stability, growth and public services. We also protect the vulnerable. 
because to be British is to be compassionate, and this is a compassionate Conservative government. We are not alone in facing these problems, but today we respond to an international crisis with British values. We are honest about the challenges and we are fair in our solutions. Yes, we take difficult decisions to tackle inflation and keep mortgage rates down, but our plan also leads to a shallower downturn, lower energy bills, higher growth and a stronger NHS and education system. Three priorities then today – stability, growth and public services. I start with stability. Mr Speaker, high inflation is the enemy of stability. It means higher mortgage rates, more expensive food and fuel bills, businesses failing and unemployment rising. It erodes savings, causes industrial unrest and cuts funding for public services. It hurts the poorest the most and eats away at the trust upon which a strong society is built. The Office for Budget Responsibility confirms global factors are the primary cause of current inflation. Most countries are still dealing with the fallout from a once-in-a-century pandemic. The furlough scheme, the vaccine rollout and the response of the NHS did our country proud, but they all have to be paid for. The lasting impact on supply chains has made goods more expensive and fuelled inflation, and this has been worsened by a made-in-Russia energy crisis. Putin's war in Ukraine has caused wholesale gas and electricity prices to rise to eight times their historic average. Inflation is high here, but higher in Germany, the Netherlands and Italy. Interest rates have risen here but faster in the US, Canada and New Zealand. Growth forecasts have fallen here, but fallen further in Germany. The International Monetary Fund expects one-third of the world's economy to be in recession this year or next. So the Bank of England, which has done an outstanding job since its independence, now has my wholehearted support in its mission to defeat inflation and I date today confirm we will not change its remit. But we need fiscal and monetary policy to work together. And that means the government and the bank working in lockstep. It means in particular giving the world confidence in our ability to pay our debts. British families make sacrifices every day to live within their means and so too must their government because the United Kingdom will always pay its way. Yeah. I, understand, I understand the motivation of my predecessor's mini-budget, and he was correct. He was correct to identify growth as a priority. But unfunded tax cuts are as risky as unfunded spending, which is why we reversed the planned measures. As a result, Government borrowing has fallen, the pound has strengthened, and the OBR says today that the lower interest rates generated by the government's actions are already benefiting our economy and public finances. But, Mr Speaker, credibility cannot be taken for granted. And yesterday's inflation figures show we must continue a relentless fight to bring it down, including a rock-solid commitment to rebuild our public finances. Richard Hughes and his team at the OBR today lay out starkly the impact of global headwinds on the UK economy, and I'm enormously grateful to him and his team for their thorough work. The OBR forecasts the UK's inflation rate to be 9.1% this year and 7.4% next year. They confirm that our actions today help inflation to fall sharply from the middle of next year. They also judge that the UK, like other countries, is now in recession. Overall this year, the economy is still forecast to grow by 4.2%. GDP then falls in 2023 by 1.4%. 
before rising by 1.3%, 2.6% and 2.7% in the following three years. The OBR says higher energy prices explain the majority of the downward revision in cumulative growth since March. They also expect a rise in unemployment from 3.6% today to 4.9% in 2024, before falling to 4.1%. Today's decisions mean that over the next five years, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor half. of the Exchequer, with this a forecast year, widely months. anticipated and very much different from the Bank of England. Of course, the governor of the Bank of England making headlines a number of days ago with a two-year recession, and I did not hear that there in the optimism of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. We welcome all of you on radio and television worldwide across America uh, on a Thursday morning claims here in two hours. But the claim that I hear there, Lisa, before we go to Guy Johnson, is this was an, a statement of international ramifications towards a situation the United Kingdom is. Could he just have said it's America's fault? <laughs> well, I mean, that's what everybody's been saying, and America's saying it's not <clears throat> just us, it's everybody, and we're actually managing it better than everybody else. 11.1% right. is idiosyncratic to also the United Kingdom and to Europe based on the energy crisis, but it is being felt around the world. And the austerity and the emphasis on bringing down inflation, really important. Two statistics that I really want to frame this for the American audience that are so different. And again, the headline here is the, uh, the 2023 guesstimate of their economy, 1.8% becomes a positive 1.4%. A gallon of petrol, as Mr. Farrow had said, or Guy Johnson uh, would say, a gallon of petrol is different within the United Kingdom. It is a stunning $7.30 cents per gallon versus $3.70 uh, that we see in the United States. And the other we can't forget, and Guy Johnson knows this, is the size of their economy. It is absolutely stunning how much smaller it is than the United Kingdom. Guy Johnson joins us now uh, in London. Guy, it's a more optimistic construction than we heard from the Bank of England and Governor Bailey. Who's correct on the view forward on economic growth? Tom, when, when the governor of the Bank of England talked about that two-year recession, he was saying if current market pricing on where rates go is realized, we will have that length of a recession. However, we don't anticipate that rates will get that high. Therefore, by extension, we don't think the, the downturn will be as severe uh, as maybe that extreme forecast would suggest. So I don't think they're quite as unaligned uh, as maybe they look at first blush in terms uh, of what the headlines look like. Um, Jeremy Hunt's the OBR, and we're going to get a briefing from the OBR around 2 p.m. today are certainly suggesting that the UK is already in recession yeah. and that it will resain, remain in recession for really quite some time, Tom. Um, the <clears> issue now is how we manage inflation through that process, how high rates are ultimately going to go and how severe the fiscal contraction is going to be. Tom, what we are witnessing here is a massive U-turn. We are going from 45 billion of tax cuts to circa 20 billion of tax rises, plus a significant fiscal uh, event in terms of the contraction we're going to see in government spending. So a, a massive U-turn uh, being experienced here in the UK. Guy, this is so, so important, and I think it really becomes an international story, as we heard from the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Most people in England are not going to buy the idea this is international in any way. Why is he doing that? Why is he selling an international event affecting the United Kingdom? This is the politics, Tom. What he is effectively trying to do is shift the blame. This is not our fault. This is something that all countries are experiencing at the moment. There is some element of truth in that. Clearly, there are idiosyncratic factors that are affecting the UK. Brexit is the one that instantly springs to mind, and clearly that is having uh, an effect on the economy. But there are international factors as well. You were just talking about the, the cost of energy. It is significantly higher here, uh, not just at the petrol pump, but uh, in terms of the gas prices, yeah. the energy prices, electricity prices uh, that we're all having to pay. So there's some element of truth there, but there are idiosyncratic Brexit, British related issues uh, that are also affecting this economy. I'm looking right now, and I was expecting, given the fact that they expect the UK GDP forecast, uh, they expect the GDP to shrink just 1.4% next year from 1.8% of a gain before. It seems like you would end up having an even bigger reaction in the pound than you're having. You're seeing it 118, not that far off where it was. How do you explain that? 
So let's think about where the pound has come from, Lisa. Uh, and I know a lot of people are scratching their heads over this at the moment. But think about where we were and think about where we're coming from. I come back to this issue of this U-turn. And markets, as we all know, the pendulum often swings too far. And maybe that's what we're experiencing right now. But we've gone from a massive 45 billion of unfunded tax cuts to tax rises and fiscal consolidation. So you're getting a massive swing here. You're going from a government, a chancellor that was playing fast and loose, some would argue, with the British economy, given how feeble our markets are at the moment, to a chancellor that feels um, more technocratic, um, that, that appears to have a grip on the situation, and that is what the markets are ultimately looking for here. So the pound maybe <coughs> swung too far when it came to what we saw under Kwasi Kwarteng. Maybe it's swinging too far back the other way uh, because Jeremy Hunt isn't Kwasi Kwarteng and he is being the exact opposite, Certainly. the antithesis of that. We'll see ultimately where it stabilizes. But yeah, no, it's been a big bounce back, Lisa. Well, a vignette into the austerity of the United Kingdom and the path forward. Guy Johnson, thank you so much. And of course, Mr. Johnson will much more follow through on this later in the United States morning um, as well. Lisa, it's absolutely stunning to see the level of inflation there versus what we have here. Yeah, although just, just it, stunning. there is an acknowledgement of what it takes and globally, there is a feel that the priority right now yeah. is to bring it down regardless of what it takes. Futures deteriorate, negative 30. It's been a soggy two days, maybe in search of information. As Lisa mentioned, retail uh, retail earnings rather coming up as well in claims here in less than two hours. Stay with us from New York. This is Bloomberg. to the FOMC's December meeting, the data of the past few weeks have made me more comfortable considering stepping down to a 50 basis point hike. The gentleman from St. Louis, Christopher Waller, with huge respect among economics uh, professionals. He is a Federal Reserve governor as well. Speaking yesterday in a, in a slow day for Fed speak and Lisa to review here, there's 14 speakers today. <laughs> Literally, day in the life of a Fed. Maybe member. Jeremy Hunt will want to give a speech on Fed policy actually, when he's done with the austerity speech. I actually think there would be interest in a, in a sort of Fed reality TV show because it seems like we get one every day these days. It is. It's, it's a lot of speak and someone watching that and doing it for decades. Lizanne Saunders joins us now, Chief Investment Strategy. Strategist Charles Schwab, and I must say, within the talk of inversion and all that, what about the stock market? What about the rally? Lizanne, I saw somebody the other day looking at SPX or whatever, up 18%, up 17%, and trying to measure the beginning of a bull market. You're too young to remember 75 or 82. I no, remember. No. How do you figure out a bull market, Lizanne Saunders? When do you say bull market? So I actually think that the the retest and and move down below the mid June lows that we got in October looked healthier under the surface. You had a better sentiment underpinning, and in fact, at least as of Wednesday last week, you had finally seen behavioral measures of sentiment like the put call ratio get to the same amount of washout pessimism, puke phase, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it, as the attitudinal measures. And then you had a positive divergence develop at that October low, where under the surface, the breadth actually was a bit improved relative to what we saw in, in June. So I'd say you could you can check some boxes. However, I think from a more macro perspective, what's still ahead of us is more downward revisions right. to forward earnings. Uh, more stability, both in yields and the dollar. And I think we need to see stability in, in housing and PMI. So I, I don't think you can check those uh, boxes yet, even if you've got some better sentiment and technical underpinnings. Liz and Saunders, these are unusual times, to say the least. And Lisa and I want to talk to you on your research note, where you link in the upset in Bitcoin over to traditional equity investment. Are you suggesting that the damage in Bitcoin from 20,000 to 16,000, the uproar, the scandal, the innuendo can actually affect someone's 401k? Well, it depends on what they they hold. Many, certainly our investors probably don't hold a lot of crypto within their 401k, but it can sit in other parts of their overall net worth. And, and anybody that's been a holder of anything crypto related, um, has suffered. And when you saw the collapse of FTX, you you did get a sense of some margin calls kicking in, which forces selling in areas where there is more liquidity. I think that was one of the reasons why you saw the spike in the put call ratio. I think there might have been 
just some quick hedging um, or protection put on in the options market that may have been tied to crypto. But trying to figure out from here the ripple effects, the counterparty risk. I, I heard on your network uh, an interview with somebody from the CFTC that is job is to focus on the the crypto world, which is not what I do. And her response was the same: is we we just don't know yet. I'm surprised there hasn't been more weakness in in something like uh, like Bitcoin. But um, I I don't think this story is as yet been fully told. I think there are still chapters left in this uh, in this crypto story. There's a larger question, Lizanne, that has to do with: Are we there yet? Have the bubbles popped? Right. We talk about Meta, for example, shares down nearly seventy percent year to date. We talk about some of the big tech names and the small tech names that have gotten eviscerated. How do we know? If if the bubble has popped? Well, I, I think there have been many of what I've been calling micro bubbles that have in some cases popped in spectacular fashion, even beyond the 70% or so when you when you go into the sphere of crypto or SPACs, non-profitable tech, heavily shorted. The problem though is that even if you uh, see a bubble pop and and you've got drawdowns in the 70 80 90 90 plus percent range that doesn't mean you might not see at least a short term reinflation in some of those i think that was the the knee jerk reaction on thursday and friday the buying went back into some of those down the quality spectrum prior speculation driven areas of the market and i think you know back to the is it a bottom or not i think you want to fade any sharp rally down the quality spectrum. I don't think that's where you want to be in the environment right now. But uh, yeah, I would say those bubbles have popped. That that doesn't mean they can't you know come back to life at least for the uh, the short term as we've seen recently. As you talk, I think about what New York Fed President John Williams said yesterday when he talked about financial stability risks and financial risks in general not necessarily being a driver of monetary policy. It shouldn't be a driver of monetary policy, which basically was we're not going to cut just because you guys are seeing losses, basically. So at what point do you see this rhetoric, believe them, do not believe in any rate cuts, and just go into long duration and hide there for as long as you can? Well, you know, it, it's funny that you say that because, you know, the the market strength has brought with it looser financial conditions, which is not what the Fed wants. So not only are they distinguishing between market weakness or market volatility and financial system stability, which is the right thing to distinguish, and still trying to reinforce that there is no Fed put, they're not only not going to step in simply because the market is weak, it aids them in their uh, quest to see tighter financial conditions. So if anything, we may be experiencing since August, when Powell first made his comments at Jackson Hole, almost a, a Fed call where the where Fed speakers, Federal Open Mouth Committee, as we jokingly call it, have to step in and push back against looser financial conditions and any narrative that is starting to brew around, you know, a pause is mm -hmm. imminent here. And and you you continually have to to see them do that because I think this narrative of now pivot to pause is is one that is just not yet backed by by the Fed. Elizabeth Saunders, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it today to with Charles uh, Schwab on the equity market and the linkage there into uh, Bitcoin um, as well. I, I'm absolutely fascinated where we are in the equity market and the shock and the silence of the cash crew and the bears. I mean, it's really it's a really intriguing moment. And I see it day to day as we put the show together. There's just a thundering silence of the gloom per over the move that we've seen. Are you saying that they are humbled by the fact that we've no, seen I'm a just, rally? I, I is just, that the way that you're I mean, kind I haven't of looked trying at it. to You can it. do this easily <laughs> on the Bloomberg, uh, folks, and this is a one-year change. The Dow is out of correction stage, a negative 7% for one year, and SPX is mid-center between correction and bear market, negative 16%. So they've clawed back some of the losses, right? But we've heard from the bears, the, the people who actually do think they're going to be further losses next year, yeah. and they're very nuanced about it because there is still mm, money sloshing around. They're nuanced about it perhaps because it's their job, but also because right now is a nuanced moment. We're going to get to some weakness. We don't know what it's going to be. We don't know how long it's going to take. And in the meantime, people still have all of the money that hasn't yet been withdrawn from the financial system. How do you play that? And that's why you're hearing people talk about short-term rally, long-term, something um, else. 
good news. Macy's is not Target. <clears throat> Macy's with a first look here at their earnings out and a nice lift of the stock up about a dollar as well. Margins boost. Comp stores were better than the gloom that was out there. Macy's holding up retail. There's a Thanksgiving parade before you cut your Christmas tree. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This could be somewhat of a shallow recession, but more prolonged period of downturn. The market is going to continue to heal over the next year, but you're still going to have a more volatile environment. The covenant soft landing, maybe it will happen. You know, maybe we have the disinflationary forces. It has to go all the way to two for the Fed to be able to truly step off the brakes and allow for a neutral policy. We're all certainly trying to figure out when the point is correct for the Fed to slow down, when the tightening is going to slow down. This is Blue. Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television. Bloomberg Surveillance, an eventful day. Chancellor of the Exchequer, speaking of austerity here 30 minutes ago, we move on to claims here at 8.30. I don't hear anybody, Lisa, talking about claims anymore. Well, because I mean, it's like, it's they're like so noisy. News. And honestly, unless we get some massive spike in claims, do they ever tell us anything? Markets don't move on this because they're not necessarily looking at them as a real sign, except for ongoing strength in a labor market, which is not a good sign for markets right now. Ongoing strength in retail. Get it. Yesterday, collapse, target, terrible. Coal's just out with a beat, 82 cents versus 75. Don't know how that's massage. Macy's really with a remarkable performance. And it really shows what Dana Telsey said yesterday to us. Every story matters. Yeah, how much they've retrenched, how much they've shifted their inventories, how much they're really dealing uh, with their real estate footprint. We'll dig into the details. We're getting some of the yeah. others as we uh, as we speak. With Kohl's actually not doing as well, actually seeing their third quarter yeah. uh, comparative sales down 7.2% versus the estimate of 6.8%, one by one, sending a motley picture of a really difficult holiday season for a lot of people who are making a lot more difficult choices. We are must watch and must listen. I'm going to sell it to you right now. Coming up, a gentleman who's modeling out inflation, moving rapidly to a better spot summer of next year. And later on, on Inversion, which we're going to do right now, Ira Jersey will join us from Bloomberg Intelligence. And we're thrilled to bring you Ian Lingen of BMO Capital uh, Markets with his true expertise in the bond market. Lisa, this is your wheelhouse. As we have spoke this morning, we've gone from negative 63 to negative 65 basis points of inversion. Every pro is riveted to this statistic. Why? Because it means usually within 12 months after that, you get some sort of recession. And right now, a lot of economists are just pricing in about a 60%. So this is not the Fed. Right. This is just basically the world, <laughs> the market, right, <clears throat> deciding, OK, what do we see going forward? Right now, it is uh, more profitable to invest in very short-term instruments because that's how much this government has to pay you to lend to them over the short term, longer term. They've got and, confidence things will write itself. This is unusual and it portends pain. With the moving parts of this in the dynamic, the heart of the matter is longer maturity bonds are bid up, price up, and their yield comes in and that forces the inversion, right? Exactly, which yeah. is the reason why the results that we're getting are so confusing, right? Macy's doing really well. Shares popping, 5%. We've got Kohl's coming out, doing badly. Shares plunging, more than 4%. Withdrawing see, guidance. Right, and, and basically uh, the bifurcated pictures right. are hard to get a big sense of where are we now and where are we heading? What is the correct forward look when you've got execution thrown into the mix and consolidation among the strongest players? Sterling not moving much off the chance of the exchequer's speech uh, on the autumnal statement, I should say, uh, on what they're going to do about austerity and high inflation in England. We'll have to watch that 118.67 on sterling. Uh, futures deteriorate negative 24. Dow futures negative 190. The VIX doesn't give me much 24.56. Oil not part of the game uh, today. Javi Blas has been on fire writing about hydrocarbons. Yeah, food. he really has. And how much people are worried about diesel. And we've yeah. seen the White House suddenly assembling some sort of meeting on diesel yeah. as inventories go down and prices 
cases still are around uh, record highs. What I'm listening to today is really the fun Please. speak because we're getting a ton of it. We're getting James Bullard, Michelle Bowman, Loretta Mester, Philip Jefferson, Neil Kashkari all speaking today. And then later on this evening, there's a, an event with Charlie <clears throat> Evans to celebrate his retirement. And we're going to hear from uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell, John Williams of the New York Fed, Mary Daly of San Francisco, but they're not going to be giving really central banking policy uh, statements. That said, the message has been clear. They see downturns. They see problems in the economy. They need to see that because they really have a focus on inflation and they are willing to raise rates. Mary Daly yesterday saying between 4.75 percent and five and a quarter percent. That is a terminal rate she thinks is reasonable and they plan to hold it there. Today, the economic data, how quickly is this making its way into the economy? 8.30 a.m. We get October housing starts and building permits. The housing data is grim, just as a general statement. It's grim and it's changing at a rapid speed that isn't necessarily going to filter into some of the inflation data for some time. But in the meantime, people are feeling it in real time. When those sales are not mm. getting done, people are not moving. There is no inventory. And when people right. buy, they cannot afford to buy. And Jason Furman of Harvard with the observation of the last 24 hours that when you look at current rents, what's called spot rents, the actual inflation statistics are coming down, disinflating much more rapidly. Yeah. And, and at 10 a.m., we do get some of those October sales figures and we'll get some sense. And we've been talking about this, the earnings that have been coming out. And we did get from Macy's and Kohl's. And it is a tale of two different stores. Uh, Macy's doing really well with those shares popping more than 7 percent in the pre-market trading and Kohl's plunging wow. more than 6 percent. Does that beautifully explain the divergence? It's <laughs> just two different stories of managing two distinct customer bases, right? I mean, who's Macy's targeting versus who's Kohl's targeting and how that is really uh, pulling apart. Kohl's typically caters to more middle income and lower income uh, households. Mm -hmm. So how much are you going to see ongoing retrenchment among some of those right. stores as really there is a consolidation among the strongest? Again, futures negative 26 uh, this morning. This is a joy. You've got some wonderful guests this morning to drive forward the conversation. Brian Levitt can do that at Invesco, global market strategist, but far more bear Buried in his note is to model out the path to 3.2% inflation <laughs> by the summer of next year. Many would say, Brian, that's a world turned upside down. What happens to our investment portfolios, equities and bonds, if we get a levit 3.2%? Yeah, the reason I came up with that is just saying over the last uh, four months, inflation's averaged about 0.3 a month. You continue to do that through June of 2024, you're at 3.2% inflation. And right now, it's a market that's trading on whether inflation is coming in better or worse relative to expectations. So we don't need it to be good. We need it to be better relative to expectations. As that happens, then we're likely to see that Fed pause. It's like the old Coca-Cola commercials, the pause that refreshes. And, and so that is what the markets mm -hmm. are responding to. Now, maybe they get a little bit ahead of themselves in the short term, right. but as inflation comes down, it should set the stage for a recovery. Do I want to be widely diversified or is it active alpha generating individual stock and bond selection or sector selection that will matter? Well, it, it should be a more it should be an environment more for active management, particularly if you look at the bigger indices. The bigger indices are still heavily concentrated in um, you know some of those larger names where those you know technicals on those stocks still look a bit broken. Whereas if you start to think about more of a recovery trade, you know more value oriented parts of the market tend to do well. More of the cyclicals, smaller mid capitalization that suggests that. You, you either want an active manager looking at that, or you may want to consider different weighting methodologies, whether that is um, equal weight, or which will be more value oriented or small or, or, or more or lower capitalization, or whether that's even something that's dynamic that shifts um, across different parts of the different factors in the market throughout different cycles. So, Brian, or different parts of the cycle. When we look out right now and people try to get optimistic, others come in, like Axel Weber, the former chair of UBS, as he spoke at uh, NEF and said this, I wouldn't be surprised if we have further episodes in the market where the combined rate increases and withdrawal of liquidity will lead to pockets of weaknesses in financial marks, markets because of leveraged st strategies getting cold. How much are you waiting for the next shoe to drop? As so many people are. Yeah, I mean, look, we have volatility in these markets until there's policy clarity. People always ask me, when does volatility come to markets? Well, when there's policy uncertainty. And the challenge here is we've been dealing with policy uncertainty since the fall. 
And so that's a long time to be grappling with it, particularly when the economy is deteriorating. Usually you see a Fed step in and, and ease things. So there are some challenges. Like we, we haven't seen a big blowout event. We haven't seen the VIX to 40. So it's not to say that there isn't um, potential challenge in here, but for, for intermediate term investors, you know, they're already, already down peak to drop 26% in, in the U.S. market. Um, that's about average for a recession. And you, you start to think about what that recovery looks like. And, and that recovery is going to be driven by inflation coming down pretty rapidly, which is also what the break-even markets are suggesting. Just quickly, Brian, does tech reassert itself when the market does recover? Well, it's pretty rare for what something that brought you into it takes you out of it as well. Now, the valuations on, on a lot of the tech names are looking more attractive. Typically, what happens when you move from more of a contractionary environment to a recovery, the more value-oriented parts of the market tend to outperform. And then you have to consider structurally what rate and inflation environment are we going to end in? Are we going back to a 1.5% environment or are we going to settle in at a 2.5% environment? If it's a 2.5% environment, then it's likely to be more the value um, leadership than, than um, what was a, a significant growth leadership in a very weak growth, low inflation environment over the last cycle. Brian Levitt, thank you so much. With Invesco and Global Market Strategy, it's not, I want to make clear, this is not an economist modeling on 3.2% inflation uh, to the uh, middle of next year, but it's, it's an idea of the what's the what if that happens. And again, that's with the one year on you know, you, you, you move on and you get a new set of statistics as well. Lisa, by, by massive acclaim of our giant international audience, it's time now for World Cup chat. Both of us <laughs> I'm are so qualified. Myself. Yeah, exactly. Two Americans faking that they know anything about soccer. What's, which we what's call amazing football. about this, and thank you to The Athletic for getting me through this. We have to do this for John. We miss him so much. <laughs> and the bottom line is they're sending two people from England. One has hardly played since October and the other only played, like, part of the game last week. And they've convinced the coach to go to Cutter, the wonderful Kelvin Phillips and the guy named Walker, who I don't even know. But that's the debates that are going on. These guys are all injured, as John says. Yeah, well, I will say that I'm not even going to pretend because all the people, all our viewers who are well more educated on this are just going to sit there being like, really, John does not want to see this. No, he does not. He is rolling over in his bed right now just saying, oh. You, you and I have to find <laughs> an Argentinian bar. All right, let's in go. New York to watch. That's, that's the only way to do this. <laughs> and that, folks, is your World Cup chat for the day. <laughs> Stay with us if you can. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has laid out his conditions for peace. Zelensky says only the return of territory taken by Russia will allow an end to the war. And that includes Crimea, which was annexed in 2014. Crimea is part of Ukraine. This is not just a state within a state. It's part of our country and part of our sovereignty. Therefore, indeed, the occupation of the Crimea and Donbass will bring the end to the war. Zelensky spoke to the Bloomberg New Economy Forum in Singapore. In the UK, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt is outlining a series of tax hikes and spending cuts aimed at getting public finances under control. The threshold at which the top tax rate is paid has been lowered. Hunt also expanded the windfall tax in the oil and gas sector. He says the moves will total $65 billion in new revenues and savings. More than a week after the elections, Republicans have won a narrow majority in the House that gives them the power to halt President Biden's agenda. Still, their slim margin is a letdown. The party has counted on decisive election results as a springboard for the 2024 presidential race. And former FTX CEO Sam Bankman-Fried is telling his side of the company's collapse, and he's doing it through a series of tweets. Bankman-Fried admitted that FTX got overconfident and careless and said he was due his best to save the customer's cash. FTX's new management, though, said Bankman-Fried does not speak on the company's behalf. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
using monetary policy to mitigate financial stability vulnerabilities can lead to unfavorable outcomes for the economy. And monetary, monetary policy should not try to be the jack of all trades and a master of none. The comment of yesterday, there is no if, and, or buts about it. If you're in the game of Global Wall Street, the gentleman from San Francisco and New York, John Williams there, yes, our starred with a blistering two sentences. Lisa Abramowitz, there was the arch academic saying, would everybody stop dovetailing financial stability into monetary policy responsibility? He didn't mince words. No, we cannot be a jack of all trades and a master of none. In other words, we're not going to try to solve market problems at the at the potential expense of not targeting inflation. Inflation is the preeminent concern, and they're going hard against that. I can't wait to see how Loretta Mester plays off that. I have such respect for Dr. Mester at Cleveland and the mathematics of all this theory and mumbo-jumbo. What are we going to hear today following on from John Williams? Probably a similar message, because mm. even the, the doves really have been pretty hard. They all agree inflation is the foremost concern. The lag times perhaps <clears throat> are in question. But Gita Gopinath, I keep going back to what she said at the IMF. She raised concerns about the uh, collective causes or the collective consequence right. of all of the rate hikes that you're seeing around the world. But then she said that people have to stay the course because we cannot have another 1970s. They cannot fail with their mandate. We now turn to Washington. Anne-Marie Horton mopping up the G20 meeting. She is in Bali, Indonesia. The president is home. They always come home, Anne-Marie. And he comes home to what I'm going to say with immense respect for the lady of Baltimore and then her San Francisco, Speaker Pelosi. That is front and center. It is Pelosi Thursday. There's no other way about it. Frame this for our international audience, Anne-Marie. Does Speaker Pelosi go and see the president today? That's a great question, Tom. I'm not sure if she goes and sees him, but clearly they likely would have had a conversation with her uh, office saying yesterday that she's going to talk and announce her future plans today. She insinuated recently in an interview with CNN that part of her decision making on whether or not she uh, passes on the leadership post and doesn't want to uh, continue on on that and, and retires is the fact that also what happened to her husband recently at the end of October when he was attacked with a hammer with someone breaking into their home. Mm -hmm. So she obviously is consulting with her family as well. But for international audience and for the domestic audience, clearly Speaker Pelosi has been in the limelight for decades uh, as a politician and then, of course, really being the driver behind right. the Democrats in the House, the first woman to uh, lead the chamber. And today we'll hear what she has to say. And, you know, you look at what Greg Vallier has to say. It's not just Speaker Pelosi. He's talking about a shift, a huge right, generational right. shift, because many in the Democratic Party want to move away from the octogenarians, not just her, but Mr. Hoyer and Clyborne as well. I was stunned. I, I had forgotten Steny Hoyer of Maryland is 83 years old. Is there the same tendency in the Republican Party? I believe they have a 76-year-old running for president. Uh, again, are the Republicans looking for Ute as well? Well, I think they're looking for something different, even if it's not youth, maybe youth with individuals that are also potentially, no one has come out, but potentially vying for that top spot. It's interesting when you look at the Republican Party, because on one hand, of course, we've talked about this all week, Ken Griffin, Steve Schwartzman, these individuals no longer want to back the president. You heard from Mike Pence, the uh, President Trump's former vice president saying he thinks there are other options. And you are hearing that people want to move away. The Republicans want to move away from former President Trump, who's obviously their bearer right now, their leader. And then you look at what uh, McCarthy is dealing with as he's set to likely become Speaker of the House. He's dealing with the fact that he needs 218 to vote for him, ironclad in January, to make sure he can get that gavel. And what he's dealing with is the fact that he also has a number of individuals on the very right of his party that he is going to have to acquiesce to make sure he gets their vote to become speaker. So to say that Trump is long gone would not be correct, 
but obviously at the very top levels of the party, they also want fresh blood. We do now have a majority in the House, as we've been talking about all morning. 218 have been selected for the Republicans, an increase of about eight seats. Uh, they needed five to get the majority. They just squeaked through, not the red wave that many people had expected. As we really parse through the results of why there was not a red wave, what's the postmortem looking like? a great question. There's going to be a big postmortem, and we've talked about this recently as well, in, I think, two areas. One, the fact that it wasn't the red wave, more of a ripple. What did the Republicans not get out the message that they wanted, which was it was the Biden administration or the Democrats' fault for things that all of the constituents across America feel, which is higher inflation. But how are the Republicans not able to turn that message around and say our plan was better? Potentially, the fact that they were saying that they want to make some cuts to uh, issues like Social Security and Medicare, did that not help them at the very end of the campaigning? Because the Democrats really harnessed that. The second in the postmortem is you have to take a look at Deep Blue New York. The Republicans were able to squeeze through because they flipped a number of Democratic seats. Just a handful, but enough in this very liberal state that mostly always goes blue. So these are, I think, two postmortems right. for both sides, the GOP <clears throat> and the Democrats following this midterms. Emery, thank you. And safe travels. Emery Horton with terrific reporting from the G20 meetings and particularly the meeting of the president of China and the president of the United States. Lisa, you mentioned this earlier, and you really wonder what the— maybe it's one of the one stabilities in Washington is, is a bipartisan effort to put China in its place. We'll have to see how that works out. Well, and how consistent the message is when there <clears throat> is also a feeling of a need for one another still and talk of some sort of collaborative effort. I don't know. I, I was looking, actually, at some comments from different companies, and it's really all over the place in terms of whether they're staying in China, prioritizing <clears throat> it, or getting out. Certainly the banking industry still seeing that they need to have a footprint in China, as it is right. still the world's second biggest economy. Let's get out front and yield right now, as we've got Ian Lingen and Irish Jersey coming up. A 369 10-year becomes a 3.72% 10-year uh, yield. Two-year yield, we had the 5% chat days ago, 4.37%. Shows a stunning shift that we've seen uh, in what is a nascent, uh, I guess I'm going to call the nascent uh, bull market. Lisa, the real yield, we had a 160, 161. We were going, what if we get to 2%? The 10-year real yield, 1.40%. I think that's been under-discussed. And this is the conundrum for the Fed, right? The more that people start to pile into long-term <laughs> debt, the more that that eases financial conditions, as you said, a lesser real yield, and sends people back to risk. So this is what they're trying to push against in rhetoric that's increasingly hawkish, even as they talk about shifting down to a 50 basis point rate hike next month. Am, am I off the mark? Am I off the mark on it's a zombie roll up 2023? I mean, the energy out there is all of a sudden money costs. There's a cost of money. There's a cost of money. Where people are looking for that is in the private markets, because that's okay. the area that hasn't okay. perhaps seen the fallout and doesn't see as much ready capital ready to flood in. Stunning. For those of you on radio, to see it on TV is stunning. The 210 spread, the inversion, negative 65 basis points. Ian Lingen, BMO Capital Market, Ira Jersey, and Sarah Hewen, next. Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom King. Mr. Farrell on assignment this morning. Good to have him off here, and we'll see if we see him uh, tomorrow. Futures negative 27. They deteriorate. Dow futures negative 200. Those levels under 4,000 on SPX, 3942. Dow 33,300. Haven't seen much there in the last number of days. The VIX, I'm going to call it maybe 23 to 24, as Lizanne Saunders of Schwab said. It is a churn looking for Fed uh, information. Let's get right to it right now. We're going to do London and do austerity, but first, an austere view of retail names, Lisa with a stock report. Well, Where do you begin? Well, let's talk about the two names that reported earnings this morning, <clears> because it is such an interesting differentiation of the haves and the have-nots. Let's start with Macy's. They reported better-than-expected earnings. They increased their full-year forecast. Those shares popping more than 8% now. And when you look through some of the results, they're managing their inventories well. And this really is one of the key points for retailers. How much stuff do they have stockpiled that they have to sell at a discount? And Macy's actually attributes some of the gains to some of their online traffic 
tracking systems, right? We always talked about blockchain actually being useful for some of these companies. That It makes it a, them able to better manage this. And inventories were only up 4% in the third quarter, which is actually really, that's really... That's amazing. That's amazing, right. Yeah, that's, 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 that's really notable. That's way better than Target yesterday. That's way better than Target. And yeah. it's the, the differentiation between the haves and the have-nots. For the have-nots, Kohl's withdraws full-year guidance. It also lost its CEO unexpectedly and is looking at inventories that have still been incredibly high. Those shares lower by 4%. <clears throat> How much is it's this amazing. an execution amazing. story? Yes, at this yes. point, what you decide to buy, how you decide to sell it, where you discount, how quickly you discount, whether you end up doing this. And when I talk about an execution story, it's been all year, Macy's year to date, down 24%, 25%, Kohl's down almost 40%. So the differentiation continues and, after and, earnings that confirm that. And part of this it is a broad statement is what portion of America is in recession now? I, I don't like this idea we're all in it, we're not. There's a huge body of America really struggling as represented by Kohl's. Which is the reason why what you buy and what you decide to sell may make the difference between the winners and losers, right? I mean, Walmart gained share in the grocery business, which people are still buying. You're seeing the number of purchases come down, yeah. but the ticket items of big purchases, uh, the actual <clears throat> headline figure go up because people are spending more in bulk on one item and then retrenching in other areas. Mohamed well, Elarian on Britain, on the United Kingdom as well. The United Kingdom's Office for Budget Responsibility confirms the intensification of stagflation. It is a unique austerity in the United Kingdom. In the briefest here, the ramifications for the United States as well with Standard Charter. Sarah Hewen is head of Europe and America's uh, research. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. What is the level of austerity in the United Kingdom? Well, it's 50, 55 billion pounds worth over the next five years. So that's going to be austerity through um, real f freeze in public sector spending and creeping tax increases. Uh, there's a big hole in public finances that needs to be filled. And um, the Chancellor's announced <coughs> the measures that, that we had expected right. really to try to fill that gap. I want you to talk about scale and magnitude. I think I have to remind myself of this, folks, every day. We equate U.S.-U.K. analysis. The nominal GDP of the United States is $23 trillion -ish dollars. The United Kingdom is 14% is large. It's a much, much smaller economy. Sarah Hewen, do they have the scale, the magnitude, the degrees of freedom to solve this conundrum? Yes, they do, but it's quite a tough ask because at the same time we're going through what looks like to likely to be a prolonged recession. Um, the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility is forecasting a contraction of GDP of 1.4% next year and then a very mild uptick in 2024 of just 1.3%. And that's at a time when we'll still have inflation way above the 2% Bank of England target. So it's a, a difficult backdrop uh, in which to try to find savings and try to stabilize debt to GDP. The expectation is debt to GDP is going to continue to rise um, up in the high 90s as a percent until uh, for, for the next few years before then starting to edge lower. Sarah, did you hear uh, the chancellor really blame the U.S. for the inflation that the U.K. was feeling? Well, there was a blame on global factors for inflation and for broader problems. Uh, clearly, there's been an, uh, the the invasion of Ukraine and the impact that that's had on commodity prices has been a feature. Uh, what he glossed over was the impact that we're feeling from the weakness of sterling, which has, of course, raised import costs more than otherwise would be the case. Um, so there's quite a focus on external problems that have caused the uh, recession here in the UK. UK, um, but not too much focus on what's self-generated. How much do you actually see this budget as sustainable? How much they're planning to bring debt down? How quickly, given the 11.1% CPI? It's sustainable to the extent that uh, they, it had to be realistic. Uh, markets um, responded very, very poorly to what was an completely unrealistic budget just a couple of months ago. And so one of the primary 
drivers for today's budget was to ensure that markets weren't upset. And in fact, we've seen very little movement in Mm -hmm. yields. We've seen very little movement in the pound. Um, Sustainability, (laughs) though, of course, when we're going through a recession and having had very severe public sector cuts over the past decade, that is going to be quite tough for the uh, living in the UK. Is there a headline that I'm going to say as an amateur launches back to Clement Attlee? And maybe the reason why Churchill was shown the door after World War II. The United Kingdom Office of Budget Responsibility sees record fall in household disposable income. And to see record fall, folks, that goes back to at least Henry VIII, I am, I am. I mean, that's a huge headline of the pain that's out there right now. Do they have to de-Brexit the United Kingdom? Do they have to reverse selected Brexit policies to help jumpstart this economy? I think that there's very little appetite at the moment in government or even outside government to reverse Brexit. And indeed, the Chancellor was doubling down on some of the uh, removing some of the EU regulations that apparently are holding back the UK. Um, but that's uh, not necessarily going to be kickstarting growth anytime soon. You're right about the big. Uh, the big collapse in real incomes. Uh, Wages are just rising way behind inflation. Um, Savings are being squeezed. We're already seeing signs of recession. The economy contracted in (coughs) the third quarter. And I think that there's worse to come. And this is the environment where we're tightening fiscal policy and where the Bank of England is continuing to raise rates. Lisa, then why is Sterling gone 103 to 118 based on what Dr. Hewen just said? Because there is stability for the first time and there is some sort of policy policy predictability and there is policy predictability globally in terms of interest rates with central bankers raising rates pretty consistently, this tightening cycle. And we talk about the lag effect, Sarah, you talk about the crimping of household budgets. When do we know what the lag effect is of all of this tightening? How long will it take before we see peak pain and peak effect on inflation? I think that's going to take us another few months and we're probably looking into the second half of next year for the full effect of the Bank of England's tightening so far to really be felt in in lowering inflation. Um, And of course, in the UK, we're likely to see energy bills rising again in April, uh, which will further slow the decline in inflation. So we're we're in it for the long haul. 2023 is, is still going to be a high inflation and recessionary environment for the UK. Sarah Hewen, thank you so much for the brief. Just outstanding there, folks, on, you know, as David Blanchflower says, there's Brexit, maybe there's some politics involved, and you get up to not stochastic where inflation comes up and comes down, but Lisa is just not coming down. I don't hear that model from anybody in the United Kingdom. Yeah, and you talk like about here. yeah, well you talk about Brexit and you talk <clears throat> about how much the scenario has changed. And there was a story in the Financial Times about Ireland and how they bet really big on big tech, right? Because they were trying to lure in a lot of international and with their companies tax policy with their and all tax that. policy. Yeah, yeah. And now they're disproportionately struggling in the face of layoffs because of the retrenchment that you're seeing in big tech around the world. It just shows all of the myriad <clears throat> problems that are yeah. kind of facing all of the different nations that also have had massive structural shift. On a Thursday, let's sell the data coming forward. And we've underplayed this today, but we do see, and Lizanne Saunders, I think, has been great with her charts on the complete collapse of housing, collating in all the national experts. Housing starts, survey down, building permits, survey down, month over month. Maybe it's better than the grimness last week. We'll see what the revisions are. And then, of course, we have claims, which is not housing, but one indicator there uh, that's been actually pretty fully employed. You pointed me to this Dallas Fed report that was put out this week on uh, the housing Martinez market. Garcia, outstanding. It outstanding. was outstanding. I can confirm. Did I do okay? It was great. And yes. I appreciate you passing yes. it along. And I, I was reading more behind it. it. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, that really highlights the level of froth that was built into the housing market by all historic <clears throat> measures right. during the pandemic. So how do we unwind from that? Okay. What does that mean for household wealth? Should we tell a dirty little secret here of surveillance? We don't actually like do this research ourselves, folks. We'll steal from anyone. <laughs> and to say that the, the ginormous institution coming out of McChesney Martin in 1951 are the regional feds with young PhDs that are eager to do brilliant work like Dr. Martinez Garcia 
uh, at the Dallas Fed. He's out of Spain. I believe he's out of pen, and I can't remember where else. I'm sorry, the brain uh, freezes. But there's eight pages of brilliance by a young PhD. And really parsing through the effect on the broader economy, if yeah. you do get some sort of housing downturn and the fear of some sort of spiraling. <clears throat> but, you know, this is what people keep pushing back against. There isn't the leverage in the system. There isn't the no. leverage in the housing market. The housing market there at 8.30 this morning. We'll have much more on that. John Writing will weigh in as well. He's chief economic advisor at Breen uh, Capital. Coming up, Ian Lingen on Curve Inversion. Ira Jersey on Curve Inversion. Stay with us, Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt unveiled his plan to fill a fiscal gap with tax hikes and spending cuts. The government will increase the windfall tax on oil and gas companies. It will also lower the threshold for those who pay the top 45 percent individual tax rate. And there will be an almost real term standstill in spending on public services at a time when demand for them is growing. It's a power shift in Washington, although not as big as Republicans had hoped for. The GOP has won a narrow majority in the House that gives them the ability to block President Biden's agenda. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy tweeted that Americans are ready for a new direction and Republicans are ready to deliver. Democrats had controlled the House the last four years. There was a surprising public confrontation at the G20 summit in Indonesia. China's President Xi Jinping accused Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of leaking details of a private meeting between the two. Xi told Trudeau the leak was inappropriate. Trudeau responded that Canadians believe in free, open and frank dialogue. And workers at Starbucks who are seeking union contracts will stage a day-long strike today at more than 100 stores. Now, they say that management isn't bargaining in good faith. Starbucks Workers United has unionized about 260 of the chain's 9,000 corporate-run sites in the U.S. Starbucks says it will respect the workers' rights to protest lawfully. And in Europe, auto sales rose in October for the third month in a row. Still, there's concern that deteriorating economic conditions are starting to put off buyers. New car registrations climbed 14 percent last month. Europe's energy crisis is driving up costs and standing in the way of a more substantial recovery. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We're all certainly trying to figure out when the um, point is correct for the Fed to slow down when the tightening is going to slow down. And it really does come back to a middle class driven inflation at this point. The Fed um, ultimately needs to go uh, very aggressively, as, as they have already, to just start to get a crack in the real economy. Marvin Lowe, State Street senior global macro strategist, was piercing yesterday on the jumble that we're living right now. Again, in 45 minutes, we get claims out and then on to some important housing data. I don't know which is more important today, Lisa, claims or housing. You make the call. Housing. I, I agree. I just made the call. You made the call. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I mean, we the second really derivatives are we've never we've never seen the rates of change in housing we're seeing right now, and the potential wealth effect as potentially things reverse a bit more. Futures deteriorate. Negative twenty five has become negative thirty six on SPX. Call it nine tenths of a percent. There's a real weight right now uh, to the tape. For those watching Bitcoin, Bitcoin is remarkably stable here. Sixteen thousand five hundred. Uh, in the bond market, the curve inversion, negative 66 basis points, is truly historic. Ira Jersey scheduled to be with us later. And right now, we are thrilled and honored to bring you for Global Wall Street, Ian Lingen. He's head of U.S. rate strategy at BMO Capital Markets. I called up Jersey and I said, I'm only talking to people today that have read Fred Frank Fabosi cover to cover. In the bond world, folks, like Lingen's world, you have a Frank, Frank Fabosi textbook of some 900 pages that prices out hardcover at $132, and only Lincoln has read the thing cover to cover as well. Is this curve inversion in Frank Fabosi's classic text? 
Uh, Frank Fabosi was not looking for a curve inversion of this depth. I think more importantly, what Frank would have said is that this is a mispricing that needs to be rectified in the short order. We are taking the other side of that trade. We think that there's more inversion to be realized, and the most important mm -hmm. inversion inverted curve is Fed funds versus 10-year yields, not just twos versus tens. So you're going from the vanilla spread of two-year, 10-year out to the many different spreads you look at, and you're going from very short term out to 10. The dynamic of two different yields moving around, which pros are encyclopedic on, and frankly, our audience is like, say what? Is it about focusing on the 10-year dynamic or the two-year or the Fed funds dynamic? Which is more important? There? At this stage, I would say that the two-year yield reflects monetary policy expectations in the very short term, but the 10- and 30-year rates, that's the market simply moving on to what's next, and what's next is going to be a pretty significant economic slowdown. So the inversion is simply a tale of two different curves more than anything else. The yield curve contraction right now presents a huge challenge for the Federal Reserve, massive, because what you're seeing is the more they lean into hawkish talk, the more people buy longer-term treasuries, which ease financial conditions. It is this really difficult situation, a paradox for the Federal Reserve. At what point do they break something? At what point do they have to break something with rate hikes in order to get the market to say, even if you have lower rates, it is not good for risk assets? I think that ultimately what ends up happening is the Fed's watching real rates as much as anything else. Real rates remain elevated by the standard of the last uh, decade or so. And eventually, we're going to see a more significant pullback in risk assets and equities. I've personally been surprised that the S&P 500 is roughly 10 percent off of the lows. That also contributes to easier financial conditions. So the more quickly the market is willing to price in a pivot, the more the Fed will ultimately and need to do. At least you see that in the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, which was one standard deviation now and has rallied back more accommodative to negative 0.82 standard deviations. So this really raises an issue, especially as you hear John Williams basically saying, if we break something, we're going to keep rates where they are. We're not going to lower rates. And then people in the market say, mm, are you? We don't really <clears throat> believe it. So how do you view this, right, in terms of if something breaks, what does that even mean for the Fed to get some sort of response? Is the market right? So I think that there's an argument that the Fed is going to break something and allow it to be broken for longer than it has in prior cycles. So is that the S&P 500 down 25 percent from here? Maybe. It's not down 50. If stocks are off 50 percent, the Fed is going to need to respond in one way, shape, or form. What I think is more interesting when we look at what's being priced in in the market, there's an argument there's 50 basis points of rate cuts priced in for 2023. Essentially, that's what we're looking at. That's either 100 percent confidence of 50 or 25 percent confidence of 200. But what does it mean for something to break? What are you looking for to break that would even cause a Fed response? So a stronger dollar leads to emerging markets under strain defending their currencies. That could be a contagion issue. That's very much top of mind. But this cycle, I expect that what will ultimately break is going to be in the real economy. It will be on the household level, and it will be spending, and we'll be faced with a traditional economic slowdown that the Fed is content to allow play out for a while. i got 14 questions. Let me go to the Chancellor of the Exchequer who opened his autumn statement today saying so much was international ramifications uh, upon his beleaguered United Kingdom. Is our curve inversion a symbol of a Fed misguided that is redounding upon other nations, including Britain? I think that the issues facing external markets are in part a function of the fact that the Fed has pushed back against becoming the de facto central bank to the world and has been focused right. primarily on the U.S. Right. And that has come at the expense of other economies. What does this inversion mean for our banks and the financial stability John Williams wanted to ignore yesterday? What's it mean for J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, the super regionals, and smaller banks out there doing business with business? So traditionally, an inverted yield curve is bad for the financial sector because a steep curve implies the ability to create money via carry. The reality is, though, higher rates are generally better for banks than lower rates. And so if we are generally in a higher rate environment, I think that we'll find the financial sector not responding the way it typically has to an inverted yield curve. What are you, what are you going to do here? What's this change in strategy for the next week or so? I think that the market is getting poised for a breakout even more inverted from here. 
we're looking Well, give me for, scale. Come on. To, to a tenth of a percent. He wants, point, where he we wants a number. Uh, negative 75 basis points in two stins, path of least resistance. So we're on the edge of Volcker inversion. We're on the edge of 70, 79, 80 inversion. I would say we could get as deep as a negative 100 basis points by the end of the year. What does that do to our listeners and viewers? This is, folks, 45 years. I've never heard this. What does it do to us? I think that it really leaves us in a anxious position where we don't know how far the Fed's ultimately going to need to push things because they'll be coming out with even more hawkish rhetoric because, as Lisa points out, that will lead to a oh, no. lessening of financial did, or did, easing of financial conditions. Did he just say there's going to be extra special, more Fed speak? Oh, it's the Fed reality this? show. And this is what people are watching. And we all cling to every word. As much as we want to say, does right. it really matter if they keep talking? Well, yeah, actually, markets move up every time they do. Our esteemed team that puts a show together every day called up Ian Lingan today and begged. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks Greatly for having appreciate me. It. Thank you. And we're going to continue this discussion as well. Right now, we have to shift to Bitcoin with some headlines out here. And, and Lisa, I'll let you translate. Uh, Katie Greifeld's not here to translate for me, so you're in charge. So basically, uh, FTX bankruptcy lawyers are not happy uh, with their client. Basically, they're saying his tweeting, Bankman Fried's tweeting, has been complicated their case and the direct messages. We can get into that in a little bit. It's really quite notable. It was a lot of expletives yeah. in those messages. Like a rock, Bitcoin 16,500. Ian Lingen's curve inversion, negative 66 basis points. Stay with us worldwide. Bloomberg Surveillance. The Fed ultimately needs to go very aggressively to just start to get a crack in the real economy. There needs to be additional pain felt to really bring down price pressures back in line with what the Fed is looking for. The risk is for higher rates, I think, especially in light of an economy that's still resilient. The thing to keep in mind is there's a lot of money on the sideline. A year from now, we might be in a world, Lisa, where inflation is not five anymore or four. Maybe it's three. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Forget the Macy's Day Parade. It is the Fed Parade. And this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom Keen, Lisa Abramowitz, John Farrow off today on a well-deserved day off. We do continue. Good morning. And really, right now, I am saying, Tom, this is all about a Fed that has one message with Jim Bullard coming out. We are not yet at sufficiently restrictive levels. Yeah, that's the Fed talk. And we'll get much more today as well. But you see it in the markets. Let's get right to the data check. Is Lisa, you open uh, SPX negative one, Dow negative one percent, uh, NASDAQ negative one percent. These are markets moving on Fed speak. Well, this is St. Louis Fed President James Bullard, Jim Bullard, coming out right now saying that Fed policy is not yet at sufficiently restrictive levels. Hikes that. have only had limited impact so far on inflation. This is the lag effect, <clears throat> but that isn't going to stop them, right? Rates need to be increased further to curb inflation. And this really is the key. They are going to keep raising until they see some progress. And right now, whether it's retail sales, whether it's other economic indicators, they're not seeing it. Yeah, 10-year yield up six basis points, 3.7 seven five percent off three point six nine percent yesterday but lisa to me what is so so important here is there's a crew out there saying they're beginning to see substantial tea leaves showing a lesser inflation jason Furman's incredibly important tweet yesterday on housing and we get more housing data here at 8 30. the tea leaves aren't enough and this, to me, is what's telling, that when markets get optimistic about agree. the tea leaves, Fed officials come out and they say, just stop it. Well, they're just institutional. If Jim Bullard was a professor at Indiana University, it'd be a different Jim Bullard. These guys, including the vice chairman, have an institutional responsibility to be ex post and ultra cautious. They have the like they don't have the luxury of being academic. They have to affect markets in real time. And this is where the gamesmanship comes into play, where they're saying we're going to go hard and go into this and then we're going to cap the S&P level, basically. I I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's essentially what they're saying. We don't want to see things rallying that have risk. And markets are saying, we well, don't buy it. We think that you're going to cave. We've got an incredibly important set of guests here, and we will do Bitcoin and FTX and all the rest of it here at 845. Katie Greifel, I'm thrilled, is dark in the door, and uh, we'll get her on here on uh, real uproar within the, uh, what do I call it, the blockchain? The, the, is it the bit chain? <laughs> well, it's crypto assets, the bit you think chain, it's fair to say. The bit chain space. Uh, you know, I'm already getting hate mail on this. It's work, it's not feral. I'm getting hate mail, and it's, it's working out. Negative 41 on SPX futures, a full 1% uh, down. 
down, Dow negative 307. The VIX doesn't move yet, but I don't believe that number. 24.88 yield. I mentioned up seven basis points, 3.76% on the 10-year yield. I do agree it's off of the Bullard statements. That curve inversion, thank you, Ian Lingen, for joining. Negative 66 basis points, stunning over 45 years with Global Wall Street. Truly back to the time of Volcker. Oil we've barely mentioned this morning. Oil at 90. Oh, oil's down a little bit. Maybe some economic slowdown. Bet there, $91 on Brent crude. I don't know what to do with foreign exchange today. Currency, dollar strength. the chancellor moves currency, uh, moves sterling rather a little weaker and a little bit of dollar strength. I do okay A little there. bit. Yeah, you did yeah, great. Yeah, but what absolutely. we're seeing right now is a market that continually is surprised by the same message being sent by the Fed over and over again. Why is the market <laughs> surprised? I don't understand. Let's speak to the market. Beata Kerr is going to represent the market today. Go ahead of investment strategies at Bernstein Private Wealth. I'm curious from your perspective, why is the market surprised that the Fed keeps getting more and more hawkish in the rhetoric? I'm not sure that the market's surprised. I think the market's trying to find its footing. The same things that you've been quoting this morning, all investors are struggling with. It is a macro-led market. We're focused on earnings and differentiation in companies, but there's no doubt about it that inflation, 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 like you said earlier, is the key to market direction. What's the sense of consumer spending? And I say this because at the same time that you have Fed officials saying we're not seeing signs of slowing, it's not trickling in as quickly as we would like, we see the likes of Kohl's having a really hard time. We see the likes uh, yesterday from some others having a really hard time. Target not doing well. How do you parse out the winners from the losers with some sort of narrative that really gives you a sense of where things are heading? Well, there's two different narratives that you can start to interpret from the retail sales data as well as the earnings from these companies. First of all, you look at the macro picture and say, what does that mean about what the consumer has left to spend and where in the consumer spending bucket, it, who's getting most affected? And there's no doubt about it that the low-end consumer is squeezed more. That's not surprising. That's what we've historically seen when you see food and gas prices up over time, that's what's happening. Walmart, we know that they noted over 100,000 consumers are spending more on groceries at Walmart, right? But then you start to differentiate between these retailers and you look at a franchise like Costco, mm -hmm. membership-based, huge mm -hmm. loyalty, done an excellent job, not just on supply chain, but on labor, and it makes a big difference. So I think when it comes to the micro, the time now is for stock selection and company differentiation. Companies are different in how they're able to right. manage the chain and, and labor you know, as well. I'm talking my book. Uh, but I, what I love in your research note, and you get down to something that was gospel in my house, SPX, midterms, up 16%, presidential year, up 8%. you got to be kidding me. The history of these midterms we just had inflicted upon us is double-digit SPX return. Well, we have to be careful saying history always repeats I'm, itself. Come on, stay with me. It's showbiz. Yeah. Stay with me here. <laughs> it would be Work awesome to see a 16% recovery post the midterms. That is Please. what history said, Tom, and that is what we've published. But you got to get back to fundamentals and stay balanced. I mean, Lisa's point earlier about surprise. You don't want to be playing the game of trying to switch asset classes and sectors in a, in a fast way here because there is so much surprise that's possible in the market. And I think the midterms are some element of surprise as well, obviously. So... I think you have to be humble and you have to be balanced. Okay, you got to be balanced, but do you buy quality? I mean, you buy small, pack, small cap quality, mid cap quality, big stuff, Apple, whatever. Give us a differentiation of those sectors to create the active alpha you're predicting. Yeah, you must have read our note. Quality no, growth have, is an area. Have, my people read the note. I don't read the notes. Yeah, continue. quality That's growth fine. is an area that we like, and I think we like it most in the large cap space. Um, small caps are interesting as well, but obviously we feel we could be entering a recessionary period. And even if that recession is mild, critical. small caps could be more vulnerable. Lisa so. wants to jump in here, but this is critical. Are the, you going to see record use of cash by those big cap quality names? I think we could. I think they've got more strength in their balance sheets. They've yeah. got more ability to maintain um, quality just on labor as well. Obviously, you're seeing cuts and ad spending and in tech, but there's still quality names like Microsoft, like Visa, yeah. that we find attractive. I know. This is what your zombie the, no, no. thesis is. This is what you're going zombie, with this. I know exactly I, I, where you're I, heading. I'm all... <laughs> <clears throat> but I do wonder, Viata, just to build on that, because it is Arrow an important would never point. Treat me like that. It is, it's an important <clears throat> point, this sort of question of what's going to lead to the catharsis where you get capitulation by companies to be purchased at a discount from other companies. Mm -hmm. At what point you get some sort of washout. What are you looking for to signal? And I understand company specific, but on a broad level, are we there yet? 
How do you know? In terms of company risk taking to in terms lean of into stock valuations, in terms of the oh. appetite of investors. Yeah, I don't think we're at total capitulation. I mean, we think we may have seen the bottom. We feel like we're in a range bound market somewhere in the 3,600 to 4,000 in the next six to 12 months on the S&P. Our base case is for an earnings decline that we have not yet seen factored no. into the market. No. Those bottom up earnings forecasts are just starting to come down. You're starting to see 22 come down, 4Q come down. 23 hasn't yet been touched. Right. And that's because that visibility is so murky. Mm -hmm. Everybody's struggling with the ultimate Fed question. But you're seeing companies starting to respond on cost management. That's going to play out on margins. And that bad yeah. news for people is unfortunately good news ultimately for the market and for earnings. What's so. fundamental here is we now have a risk-free rate. We now have finance somewhat back to what we are weaned on. And my great theme is the zombies of all flavors are going to be rolled up in 2023. Mm -hmm. Bernstein's heritage, the black books of Bernstein's heritage is studying that. Do you see combinations and transactions on fire next year? Um, I don't think we've put out a forecast for M&A volume. No, I, I know we haven't put out a forecast. So I just, you know, yeah. Nobody's watching. Come on, help yeah. me. <laughs> we're continuing <clears throat> to see M&A volume be robust. I think what you're seeing here is financial conditions and risk-taking obviously have gone up recently. And I don't see a, a real change to that. I think companies are continuing to innovate and invest for the yeah. future. And if they can do that with roll-ups and um, right. mergers, then why not? Right, but I right. think they're going to be opportunistic. Beata Kerr, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it with thank Bernstein you. Private uh, Wealth Management today. Uh, Lisa, there's a wow headline if I've seen one. Yeah, there's just coming across right now that Blinken, Tony Blinken, uh, is uh, says that Biden asked him to travel to China early next year. That was really uh, kind of building on what we expected coming out of the Xi Jinping meeting yeah. was that Tony Blinken is going to head over to China. What are they going to talk about? And I think this is important. <clears throat> are they going to talk about the chip sector? Are they going to talk well, about uh, Taiwan? Are they going to talk about how they deal with Russia. How do you sort of uh, rank your priorities at a time of some pretty serious red lines? But by, quote, early next year, we will have a much better framework of the slowdown of China or the stability of economic China or the recovery of economic China. So, Or the reopening the of zero well, COVID. That's, there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of debates out there about China. That's the, to me, it's the uncertainty in the next year. You know, there was Even something that happened overnight. The financial stuff. The PBOC got. warned that if there was some sort of reopening, it could cause an inflationary push that they weren't expecting. And it's going to affect their easing and how much well, they're willing to ease. It just speaks to a preparation, gaming out what this looks like as China clearly needs to reopen into the rest of the world. Well, it's going to be fascinating. And, and Elizabeth Economy now with uh, uh, Secretary Raimondo at, at Commerce has just always said this is fragile or that's a new word I'm inventing. It's, I like it. It's fragiler than it uh, looks. Futures deteriorate, negative 1.2% on Standard & Poor's, negative 47 uh, points. A VIX breaks out over 25. Some fragility in the market into that important economic data. We'll see at 8.30. We look at FTX at 845. Stay with us on radio and television. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, in the UK, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt unveiled his plan to fill a fiscal gap with tax hikes and spending cuts. The government will increase the windfall tax on oil and gas companies. There will be higher taxes on wages and dividends for the wealthy. And there will be an almost real-term standstill in spending on public services at a time when demand for them is growing. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky has laid out his conditions for peace. Zelensky says only the return of territory taken by Russia will allow an end to the war, and that includes Crimea, which was annexed in 2014. Crimea is part of Ukraine. This is not just a state within a state. It's part of our country and part of our sovereignty. Therefore, indeed, the occupation of the Crimea and Donbass will bring the end to the war. Zelensky spoke to the Bloomberg New Economy Forum in Singapore. More than a week after the elections, Republicans have won a narrow majority in the House that gives them the power to halt President Biden's agenda. Still, their slim margin is a letdown. The party had counted on decisive election results as a springboard for the 2024 presidential race. 
And Macy has reported third quarter earnings that beat estimates. The department store retailer also raised its full guidance. And that's a sign that it has succeeded in luring shoppers despite consumers shifting away from discretionary spending. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. One of the biggest challenges economies around the world are facing is inflation. I think what central banks around the world have clearly recognized is that they need to move in a determined fashion to durably bring inflation down. Gita Gopinath of the International Monetary Fund, not at the spring meetings, not at their annual meeting in Marrakesh next year, in Singapore with Bloomberg, our new economy uh, forum. That was a wonderful panel. Our Stephanie Flanders in conversation with Axel Weber, of course, formerly with the Bundesbank and with Dr. Gopinath uh, as well. You can look at the, for, for that across all of Bloomberg uh, media this morning. I, I thought it was sort of a, not a snooze fest, but we'd slide through Thursday. Lisa, I was wrong. Claims in 12 minutes, housing, which is a mystery. No one, anybody, particularly with means, that's all they're talking about in America. And then we've got BitDog, and we've got, you know, an important conversation coming up here at 845. Yeah, the idea here that FTX bankruptcy lawyers, I mean, this, this story is is sort of delicious for people who like the drama of it, but it's really tragic for those people and individuals who are losing their shirts because it went to zero overnight from billions of dollars. The FTX bankruptcy lawyers accusing <clears throat> their client of yeah. Gunk, gunking up the, the case because they basically are hearing him coming out with these direct messages to reporters talking expletives about regulators and what they've done well, to people. Suddenly, Bitcoin South, thank you for that. The control room just killing it today. You know, they're just they're not they're not looking at the World Cup uh, things. They're actually paying attention to the show. Unbelievable. <laughs> Sixteen thousand seven hundred down and spiking down now, down $300. And that matters. I mean, these little moves matter right now. Yeah, but there's yeah. a broader point here, which is that <clears throat> as accommodation comes out, what does that mean in terms of who is exposed, right? There was that tweet from Brian Chesky of Airbnb. I that miss when that. the lights go on at the end of a nightclub at 2 a.m., you sort of see what's left over, and that's what it feels like right now. And how much is that we're going to see? How much more of that is there going to be out there? Very good. Nick? Benenberg joins us right now. Uh, he's international economist at Wells Fargo and maybe more than anybody I know nails foreign exchange more on a longer term basis as well. Let's dovetail your work over the years with foreign exchange into international economics. Is, is the study of the dollar, is the study of foreign exchange valuable in gaming out international economics right now? Well... Yes. I, you know, I actually think maybe the study of international economics is more helpful in terms of the dollar uh, because we've definitely seen differences in growth. Europe's already in recession. The United Kingdom, the, the Eurozone is very, very close to being there, whereas the U.S. is holding on, you know, pretty well. Uh, I think that's going to be sort of more influential in just the relative growth trends uh, helping the dollar for now, but seeing the dollar depreciate later. So uh, the study in, forget about Q4, we're almost through it. The study into next year, is it a study of what the U.S. will do or is it more centric on what Europe will do, Japan will do, a beleaguered United Kingdom will do? Which side of that trade is the one we should focus on? You know, I think there's always a focus on the United States and, you know, perhaps quite, quite rightly so, the largest financial market, the largest economy in the world. And as you earlier noted, you know, a comment here or there from the Federal Reserve policymakers, and we've seen, you know, yields higher and the dollar higher as well. So I think that's where the surprise is going to be. Um, we believe that the Federal Reserve funds rate is going to go above 5% up to five and a quarter. And so I still think it's Federal Reserve monetary policy for now that's going to drive the dollar a little bit higher and keep those foreign currencies probably on the defensive. Let's talk about some of that monetary policy. Jim Bullard in comments talking about how we're not yet restrictive also saying this. He cites policy rules suggesting rates between 5% and 7%. This is Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed moments ago, or about a half an hour or 20 minutes ago. How much are we looking at something that is going to cause the dollar to surge to levels that people are not expecting and cause some sort of fissure here that, that needs a response? 
Well, I mean, those rules or those targets are, you know, probably a moving point. And, I, you know, I think a 5% level and 7% is a long way, uh, but I think a 5% level is reasonable when you've got these inflation numbers at 7 or 8%. Now, I think longer term, you know, maybe in the region of 25 to 3 is, is kind of more reasonable. Um, uh, but uh, I think in the current context, these very high rates are, are, are more than, you know, more than appropriate. Uh, I think, you know, from your perspective or the other question, part of your question was, will we see the dollar surge to levels that, that we haven't seen before? I don't. I think we'll get back to recent peaks and maybe slightly above. Uh, but uh, for now, the dollar's moving higher. But the end of the inflation problem is probably in sight, and so we'll probably get back to recent highs, not go above them. What would a interest rate, a federal funds rate of seven percent, do to oh, an economy on. with this much debt? That's the that's the um, Graham over. Well, Nick, I'm sorry. You know, she does. This. She goes excessive. <laughs> well, it would probably. We 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 already think there's going to be a recession uh, but with the high inflation weighing on purchasing power. With these, you know, housing market being affected by these high interest rates. So, unfortunately, it would be a deeper recession um, than what we would expect. Um, but but again, not the pandemic okay. and not the global financial crisis. Did you say seven percent? That's what he. That's what Jim Bullard of the Federal Reserve of St. Louis said that it could get up to. Of course, that, that policy rules suggest rates between I'm five. Sorry. It could what be would irresponsible. Dudley say to that? He might be in agreement <clears throat> because he was someone who got out front. But uh, my question 7%? is, the the issue oh. has been this market has been able to tolerate interest rates well beyond what anybody okay. thought previously were expected. So now we're suddenly readjusting yeah. to a new normal. Yeah, Nick, you, you you just you've done so well over the decades in gaming the markets and particularly your expertise in foreign exchange. I'm absolutely fascinated by if you think all these fancy people are overcome by events and that if you get 5% or 6% or 7%, whatever the nation is, they, they're overcome by the politics of it, including what we saw in the United Kingdom this morning. Uh, well, I don't know if they're overcome by it. Uh, but, I, you know, again, I think that... Uh we're going back to levels that we haven't seen in a couple of decades. Uh, we've got Fair. inflation that we haven't seen in a couple of decades. Uh, it's all a moving target, and no one really knows where the peak is. What I would say, though, and, and again, why we think interest rates don't go to seven, maybe they get to five, why we think the dollar gets back to its Please. previous peak, is we're starting to see the first encouraging signs on the inflation front. Those supplier delivery times are down a lot. The commodity prices are down. Some of the shipping costs are down. So... You know, we think there's still some further dollar strength to go, there's still some interest rate increase, but we're pretty heavily focused on sort of the first quarter, okay. second quarter of next year as being the peak, and hopefully things will improve from then. Nick, thank you so much. Nick Benenbrook with us with Wells Fargo uh, this morning on international economics and on a dollar. DXY 107, I uh, haven't followed it against the Bloomberg dollar index this morning, but yen, and there we were looking at a, at a, at a huge move, 139, now 140. It's just a churn, I'd say to foreign exchange lease over the last number of days. It's been a churn with a consensus from an increasing number of people that perhaps the dollar has peaked, right? And if it hasn't peaked, that it's close to it, as we were just hearing from Nick. How much is that going to sort of give some sort of bottom, frankly, to where stocks can go? Because that has <clears> been one of the big drivers, right? The dollar strengthens and that's been bad. The dollar weakens, that's been risk on. How long can we continue that? Futures negative 43, Dow futures negative 323, NASDAQ down 1.2%. The VIX added 25 level 24.93 yields move no other way to put it 369 on the 10-year yield is a higher yield 3.76 uh, percent and on oil i'm going to call it quiescent 92 dollars barrel off a dollar on brent crude the foreign exchange market you heard nick benenberg talk of resiliency here for a while in u.s dollar dollar stronger today please stay with us john riding of Breen capital then katie greifeld on bitcoin This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Just moments away from uh, some prints, both with respect to jobless figures as well as housing starts, housing permits uh, to build new construction. Right now in markets, a bit of a sell-off after some of the comments out of Jim Bullard. Right now with some of the data starting to trickle out, let's head over to Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Good morning, Lisa. Well, we're seeing all the data now on the Bloomberg and initial jobless claims look like they have gone down just a touch, 222,000 from 225,000. We'll see what that uh, previous number was uh, revised to. Continuing claims do continue to rise, 1,507,000 up from 1,493. So some of the people who are losing jobs are taking longer to find new ones. Uh, that's what that's telling us. 
this, but it's 222. It's still pretty low in terms of layoffs. The uh, layoffs going on at Twitter and other places in the tech industry not really having a major effect on the national numbers. Housing starts are up for the month, 1,425,000. That is an increase of 4.2% over the revised September estimate. It's 8.8% below where it was a year ago, however. Building permits are a little bit lower, 1,526,000 uh, from 1,564,000. That's a 2.4% drop, and uh, it's 10% below where they were a year ago. Now, that's not going to surprise anybody. Housing numbers have not been good. Philadelphia Fed puts out its index, and maybe this is the uh, more interesting uh, number of the day. The Philadelphia wow. Fed index uh, drops significantly to 19.4 from 8.7 from negative 8.7. Uh, so a a significant drop there, suggesting business really really slowed in uh, the first part of November, end of October, and uh, the prices pay uh, prices paid uh, index falls to 35 from 35.3 uh, from 36.3 so still some progress being made on prices there. Employment uh, is way down, 7.1 versus 28.5. Now, these regional Fed indexes don't necessarily tell you national trends, but when you get them all out and add them together, it does uh, suggest mm. where we might be going in terms of things like uh, the ISM number, which we'll get the 1st of December. Michael, let you parse through some of the details. Just want to bring to you what the market's doing, which isn't that much, if you want to take, if be honest. You're seeing yields come off just a touch, and you're seeing uh, equities pretty much stay around those lows and futures. What I'm looking at right now, Tom, is a story that stays pretty much the same. We see housing having right. issues, definitely deteriorating. The jobs picture still pretty strong. The idea that you're not seeing right. that pop up in jobless claims that you'd be expecting, which really raises a question of how right. far the Fed will have to go. Michael McKee, my tweet of the day yesterday was Jason Furman of Harvard. He teaches a small course called Act 10, retweeted by the laureate Paul Krugman, over how rents fold into all the Michael McKee analysis. And the answer is you've got a bigger number of core inflation based on older locked in leases. But when you use the spot rent market, core inflation cascades down to a more gentle 2.8 percent. It's discussed that, Mike. Is that a valid study? Uh, definitely a valid study, and it's something that a lot of people have been talking about. The way the government computes the CPI, they take not just new rents, but existing rents. And those aren't going to change because they're already in place. Now, the Zillow numbers, which uh, Jason Furman was talking about, and there's also uh, another private uh, one out there, uh, those look at new rents only. And if you look at new rents only, then rent prices are dropping significantly. Rent's been the biggest driver in the CPI. So the question becomes for the Fed, do you pay attention to what's in the CPI and to a lesser extent in the PCE because you know that those prices are going to go down. It's just a question of time. It's actually happening right now, but it won't be reflected in the data for a couple of months. And I think the Fed is probably looking beyond some of those housing costs in CPI, seeing this other private data come in and seeing that it is uh, suggesting that housing inflation is going to go down. Michael McKee, thank you so much for breaking this all down. We'll catch up with you later in the morning as well. Joining us now, nobody better to speak about what we saw over in the United Kingdom, as well as the potential agony over lag effects, how to understand them. John Riding, Chief Economic Advisor at Breen Capital, former Economic Advisor to the Bank of England. On this Thursday, John, when you take a look at some of this data, which isn't softening quickly enough, and you hear the hardline talk <clears throat> from the Federal Reserve, what's your sense about how far behind we are in terms of of lag effects and when we'll actually see the, the ramifications? Well, Lisa, as you know, we had many discussions last year where I said that inflation was not transitory, was going to be a real problem, you know, and it, and it still is. And I mean, interestingly enough, in the numbers that, that Mike went over, um, you know, he didn't mention the prices paid, prices received data by manufacturing firms in the Philadelphia region, which, like in the New York region, went up uh, to uh, 34 and, and change from 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 about 31. So we're far from having defeated inflation at this point. And I would also take a little bit of issue on the rent story for two reasons, um, one of which is rents in the CPI 
are rising roughly in line with the overall CPI. So they're, they're neither adding nor subtracting to the overall rate of inflation. Well, people, you know, ha paying for housing, paying for food, paying for energy are really important in forming people's inflation expectations. So the fact that new rents are declining when people are paying the higher level of existing rents, I, I don't think it's inappropriate. But, but this idea that we always take out the bits that are pushing up inflation and look at inflation <coughs> excluding that, you know, I, I, I find a, you know, a bit problematic yeah. because it never that policymakers never do it the other way. Okay, this is really important because there are all these people coming out there, and this is the biggest pushback and the reason why we've gotten lifts in markets. People say there are disinflationary elements, and you pointed to the rent story, you point to the used cars, you push back, and you say that those are completely offset and then some by the other indicators. Is that right? Well, well yes. I mean, they, look, we've had... And, and I actually think Fed policymakers are somewhat on top of this. We've had three times this year, three months of the 10 months which we've had CPI data, where the so-called core, excluding food and energy, only went up by three-tenths of a percent. And it was then followed by inflation um, picking up again. So, yes, one, one report where you got an odd treatment from healthcare costs. Health insurance costs fell 4% in the CPI. Now, I'd love to have that health insurance policy, and I'm sure most people out there would love to have that, but I don't think anybody's health insurance costs fell by 4%. But, but my point is, inflation is the overall price index, and you can pick and, and choose and take this number out and take that number out, but the reality is, inflation both here right. and globally is a problem, and central banks have created, or at right. least made the problem worse, by staying too easy for too long after the pandemic. And that liquidity and, and that, those, the, that stimulus has to be soaked right. up. Now, just one second, Tom, if I may. Please. There, there is a communication issue going on at the Fed, a, a, a further change in communication. Say, look, there's three things about policy. How fast are we going to raise rates? And they've clearly signaled they're going to slow the pace of increases, and the market's got that story right. Then how high are we going to raise rates to? And then how long are we going to keep them there? And I think the market's got the how fast right. It's slowing. But I still think we're offside on how high and how long rates are going to stay there. Mar markets are pricing in barely reaching 5% on the Fed funds rate, and then the Fed quickly cutting rates thereafter. I, I, I'm amazed by that conversation. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. I'm amazed by the certitude that they're going to do a pivot or whatever you, you want to call it. This is an historic day. The Chancellor of the Exchequer stood up and said, we have austerity. You and I read Paul Johnson, 1987, The English Disease. It was a beautiful essay about the struggles of Clement Attlee, Churchill, and the rest coming forward. What is the level of crisis in your United Kingdom right now? Is it something that's solvable? Is it a two-year recession, as Bailey talks about? Or is it an English disease that is larger? I, I think that's a very um, difficult question to answer. I, I think the, the finances of the economy, prospectively going forward, are in better shape now than they were prospectively with the um, budget, the mini budget that's put forward in September that helped spark the whole uh, crisis in the gilts market. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, the UK is still struggling with Brexit and uh, uh, struggling with a lot of struggling with inflation issues. And the Bank of England, I don't think, has raised rates quickly enough or early enough to, to get on top of that. But now we're faced with this very interesting question. I think the U.S. may be faced with it. Can policymakers raise rates enough, tighten policy enough to get inflation under control without sparking a significant well, is it, is financial crisis? Is the Phillips curve crisis? operative right now? And the financial stability John Williams talked about yesterday, are these traditional theories operative right now? Well, I think the Phillips curve hasn't been operative since the late 1960s, I knew he'd and, and that I think way. it is full very. I knew what the writing answer. Very was. interesting that it gets them going. <laughs> very interesting that that the very flat Phillips curve that policy Eric, makes talk about, we can keep changes. pushing unemployment down <laughs> without raising inflation, comes back as something that's going to uh, cure the inflation problem. I mean, the, the main thing about inflation is expectations, and, and having people and companies understand that higher inflation isn't going to be allowed. And what we have in, for example, in this Philadelphia Fed report here, we saw it earlier, is company cost increases slowing. 
but the price increase is not slowing. Now, yes, the October numbers were, were a little bit encouraging, right. probably most uh. in the PPI, <clears throat> but there's a big difference between inflation right. having peaked at oh. levels we never thought we were going to get to and getting back to price stability. John, quickly, John from a Christmas tree farm north says, ask him about England, uh, U.S. and the World Cup. Uh, a nemesis team. Uh, we lost one nothing to the U.S. in 1950 in the, the first World Cup England played in. Uh, and then back in right. 2010, we, we tied 1-1. Um, day after Thanksgiving, it, it's going to be a, a, a great okay. time. And I, I'm going with England, obviously. Well, I'm shocked. John Riding, thank you so much. <laughs> thank I, you. I think John Farrell's going with England as well. That means you and I must go with the U.S. Oh, clearly, obviously. Let's, I don't know if he is going with the U.K. Let's see. Know. After we'll Lions out. Bills, we'll be able to watch England, U.S. Coming up, Katie Greifeld on Bitcoin. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the U.K., Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has outlined a $65 billion in tax hikes and spending cuts so the government can plug a hole in the budget. The wealthy will be hit with higher taxes on wages and dividends. Meanwhile, a windfall tax on oil and gas companies has been extended. It's a power shift in Washington, although not as big as Republicans had hoped for. The GOP has won a narrow majority of the House that gives them the ability to block President Biden's agenda. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy tweeted that Americans are ready for a new direction and Republicans are ready to deliver. Democrats had controlled the House the last four years. A senior IMF official says it will take some time for the full extent of this year's interest rate hikes to become apparent. Gita Gopinath also looked at what comes next for the Federal Reserve. They are uh, very likely to raise interest rates another round before the end of this year. Uh, and then the question is what comes next and i think 2023 is for 2023 the question is more about how long are you going to keep these rates at the levels that they've moved them to Gopinath spoke at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum in Singapore. In China, COVID restrictions are still impacting consumer sentiment. Alibaba reported a surprise loss after quarterly revenue barely grew. Meanwhile, the online retail giant announced a $15 billion expansion to its buyback program. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. In the area of stable coins, uh, that it would be important for Congress to step in and say, you're not permitted to offer a stable coin unless it's done under a strong prudential framework with Federal Reserve oversight, supervision, regulation, and approval. Michael Barr, the vice chair for supervision at the Federal Reserve System, they're talking about stable coin use. Only stable coin I know is when somebody has a full time job in the House. But there we are, Mr. Barr, talking about the upset of the moment. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Crypto. We do this with Katie Greifeld, and I got a number of ways to go. Let's bring up the chart of Bitcoin right now. And what you need to know it's a series of lower highs since November 14th and has rolled over ever so slightly in the last hour down $62, under 16500 When all of these players look at the price of Bitcoin, how does that correlate to their future? How are they linked to the price of Bitcoin? FTX, Mr. Silbert, of, is it DGC or DCG? DCG. See, I got it. Whatever you said, I agree. But how is it linked to the price of Bitcoin? Well, if you go to SBF's tweets, there's a lot of letters here. If you go to St. Bankman Freed's tweets, Basically, he said that FTX was over their skis on leverage. Maybe that's not such a horrible thing or it's less bad when the line is going up. But that chart's amazing because it just shows, like you said, this grind lower, this continued step down. And now we're sitting at 16,000 on Bitcoin. 
it's a lot easier to sort of cover up brewing ills in a bull market when the lines are going up. Obviously, that's not happening anymore. You and your colleagues published on Mr. Silbert last night. This is really important, folks. This guy is not SBK. He's not dashing around talking to Tom Brady. This gentleman from Connecticut out of Emory University, and all of a sudden, Barry Silbert's called into question. What do you mean by that? Well, think about what happened at Genesis. So DCG, that is the parent company. It's one of the biggest, most important empires in crypto that isn't really talked about much in mainstream media because unlike SBF, unlike CZ over at Binance. See how she just insulted me calling me mainstream (laughs) media? Let's continue. (laughs) I've spent too much time on Twitter. I'm sorry. But basically, Silbert controls what was a $10 billion crypto Mm -hmm. empire. They raised money at that valuation just last year. But yesterday, sort of the crown jewel in the empire that's genesis it's a crypto lender it's suspended withdrawals which you expect news from genesis this morning i mean all the focus the media focus is on is it sbk SBF. SBF. okay that's a publishing company out of uh, los angeles excuse Mm me um all the focus is on the guy going into bankruptcy are we wrong should we focus on mr silbert and do you expect news there today following on the shock of yesterday i think there's a lot of really deserved attention paid on sbf just the unravel has been fantastic but it is really important to watch the fallout here watch big lenders such as genesis if you had asked me two weeks ago would i expect news right. yesterday i probably would have said no but given how fast everything is moving it's something to watch right. for bloomberg has reported that genesis has hired advisors to look at options here we don't know right. specifically what those options are but right. they've hired people to that effect unfair question but it's unfair thursday fossils like like me and the ever young Lizanne Saunders all say, why hasn't Bitcoin gone down more? How it's do you respond question. to that? No, Tom, it's, it's my a only great good question, question of the day. Stay with me on this. Yeah. Why is Bitcoin not trading it? You name the price. I actually tweeted to that effect yesterday, and the tweet got 2,000 likes. Why isn't Bitcoin lower? I've never done that. When you consider the just two weeks that we've lived through and the fact that we're still at $16,000. It's not $69,000 where we were a year ago, but there is this resilience sort of built into the market. Even today, Bitcoin is it a market. That's the key question. Is there, is there, see how she looked at me on radio folks. She's looking at me like, what do you mean? It's not a market. Come on. The regulators like Michael Barr is saying, we don't, aren't sure this is a market. Mm -hmm. So it's gone 60,000 to Mm 16,000. How does it get down lower other than one of these elephants just saying, go to cash. Well, that's what's that's who's left. It's those elephants. It's those whales. That's the answer right. I keep getting when I ask people, how isn't Bitcoin falling? Right. It's that everyone who would have sold has already sold. And all you're left oh. with is these big accumulators, sort of these big hardcore believers who aren't going to sell at this point. I mean, maybe they bought into Bitcoin when it was $7 or it's these right. big institutional players. And until you see one of those right. chips fall... I mean, you're pretty much out of floor. Rachel from West Lafayette emails in. She must be Purdue University. And Rachel asks, what about the Winklevi? I mean, that's all anybody knows. People like me, dumb, we focus on the Winklevi, and they're linked in to Genesis, right? Mm -hmm. And Mr. Silbert? They are. So that was, again, one of the ripple effects from FTX through Genesis into Gemini. There's a lot of letters. There's a lot of G names, too, something to think about. But it's the Winklevi twins. Yesterday, they had this product on their platform, Gemini, called Gemini Earn, which basically... Oh, come on. Now you're going to get me going. <laughs> but that was their <clears throat> problem. family television. Because their big problem was that their one of their okay. huge counterparties was Genesis. As far as we know... The site's up and running, but uh, that's again. I'm going to talk like not me, not me, folks, but this is the critics out there, including Noel Rubini. If you give me your money, mm-hmm. we can monetize Bitcoin and make 8% or 10%. That's the game, right? Yes. How do you regulate that? I mean, some, not me, but others would say scam. Those of a a certain vintage would say executive life, 1970, whatever, 14 percent annuities. What's the difference here? I'm going to make 10 percent on BitDog. Well, again, when you strip it down the way you just did, it sort of exposes it as lending money 
in a circle. I would understand how that's hard to regulate. I'm not we a regulator. We call that the American government. Continue. <laughs> but again, it gets back to the point I made at the beginning. When the line is going up, that works to it sort works. of lend money exactly. in a circle. When you are looking at an 80% drawdown in a year and just the price of Bitcoin, there's other smaller coins that are down Drawing much down. more dramatically than that. That gets harder to do. Those returns just aren't there. You're hit with the liquidity issues that right. we're seeing rippling through the space right now. Unfair question. Let's finish with this. Katie Gray I felt 16,470. Where in your head is a tip point, a dispersion point where this unravels? Is it 15? Is it 9? Is it 12? Do you have a number in your head or our experts have in their head? I don't have a number. I would okay. say when we get to the single digits or below that 10K below 10, level, 000. maybe that's where it gets interesting because this market loves big round numbers for better or worse. There seems to be yeah. some important, I don't know, stops set up there when I mm. talk to people. So we'll see. But as I said, it sh you would have thought it would be down a lot more. Did I do okay there? That was good. I think when you're on, good. I get so much hate mail. It's <laughs> Stop like, you know, it. <laughs> I mean, Farrell gets all these love notes and I get nothing. Every time you're on, I get absolutely uh, crushed. Are you publishing today seriously, uh, Mr. Silbert? Uh, my boss would certainly hope so. Okay. Well, you know, well, you know, slide it out to an eight hour work day from six hours. Katie Greifeld, uh, there on all that's going on in this, and we'll continue to follow this. I really want to commend on radio Paul Sweeney and Matthew Miller in the 10 o'clock hour with some solid knowledge on all of this. For people like me, distant and removed uh, from this, I learn every time they open uh, their mouths. And I guess crypto show, did they get to Tuesday on the crypto show? Yeah, that was Tuesday. I mean, they got a, they got another one coming up next Tuesday. Yeah, right? we got to wait all the way till then. Uh, well, you should do one every day, the way this is going. 16,462. The markets have deteriorated through the morning. SPX negative 52. The VIX 25.12. Please stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning.